This podcast is brought to you by Kiwi Design, the leader in MetaQuest and VR accessories. And now you can deck out your device while supporting the podcast. The MetaQuest 2 is a great headset, but do you ever feel things could be a bit more comfortable? Well, we have the solution for you with lens protectors, controller grips, face covers, head straps, link cables, headset stands, and more, including my two personal favorites, the top version controller grips with added weight and an extended handle, and the Kiwi upgraded elite strap. Let's be real, we've all whacked our controller. Don't be the guy messaging Oculus support for your own mistake or waiting weeks for an out-of-stock controller. Visit the link in our show notes to prepare yourself today. After visiting the link in our show notes, make sure to use the promo code ROUGHTALKVR at checkout, all one word, to take full advantage of your savings. And make sure to click the link in our show notes so the podcast gets credit and you help support us. Remember, whatever you need, Kiwi has you covered. Hey, welcome to this episode of Rough Talk VR. Today we're joined with another interview this week. You know, we have today a bit of a legend in the tech scene, especially in what I would call the XR scene. If you look at VR, yeah, mixed reality, even, AR. Even the history. We'll see. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into it all. But today we have the the CEO and co-founder of Tilt 5. We have Jerry Ellsworth joining us today. So usually we talk MetaQuest Gaming. This is technically not vr but like i said a little bundled into that xr realm you know if mm-hmm. tilt five is definitely on the the ar side of board gaming but again we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more so do you mind to tell your tell our listeners a little bit more about you and also maybe a little bit about your background and tilt five? Oh my goodness where do you want to start thanks for having me by the way um this is going to be fun i think um <laughs> So uh, when it comes to XR, I've been in the uh, XR space probably 13 years or so. I'd have to go back and think, but uh, I cut my teeth in XR at Valve Software. So I helped them put together their first hardware R&D department um, where we explored all kinds of things about XR and other gaming um, applications. Um, But, you know, uh, give you a little background on Tilt 5. Uh, Tilt 5, uh, we have these... AR glasses, they're, you know, the widest field of view AR glasses out there. So for the video viewers, you can see them, you know, very lightweight, 110 degree field of view, um, high contrast, high brightness. We can draw black. We have the pseudo light field technology that makes them very comfortable to wear. Plus we have, since you have VR listeners, we have six degrees of freedom wand. So everyone will be familiar with that. So you can interact with with your um, games that you're playing on the table. And so we uh, support not only um, board games, but pure video games as well. And uh, we've been seeing a lot of adoption in the uh, uh, enterprise and uh, professional space as well, because it just works so well to solve problems in that space. So uh, what direction do you want to go as far as my background? It's quite uh, uh, (laughs) a long drawn out story if you want to go back a ways. Well, I, always, I, I honestly, I love starting from the beginning just of someone's journey to figure out what led them to where they are today. Because mm-hmm. sometimes it's off the beaten path and sometimes it's just by happenstance. So, Well, I also think that's the best way to understand, you know, today's finished product of, of <laughs> yeah. you know. So, yeah, let's start from the beginning. All right. Uh, buckle up. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I I, I never imagined that I would be here today doing what I'm doing, you know, considering where I came from. So I, w- I grew up in a rural community in Oregon, little tiny community, a few thousand people. Uh, I was that nerdy kid that was into technology, but, you know, pre-internet days, you know, how do you learn about technology? There weren't a lot of resources out there for me. Um, so... I would just take apart everything that I owned or every gift that I was given from my, my father just to see how it worked because I was so curious, um, which was extremely frustrating for him. Um, but uh, he was very supportive and um, uh, encouraged me to continue doing that. Um, the way he encouraged me so he didn't um, have to spend a lot on expensive toys is he actually owned a gas station, a, a service station, and he put a box out front with a sign on it that said, bring your broken electronics. And so every few weeks or so, I get this big box of like broken toasters and old tube radios and stuff. And I would just rip them apart. And I was like 
probably between the ages of nine and 12, 13, something like that. And I was just ripping everything apart. Around the same time, I got my first home computer, which was uh, the Commodore 64, fell in love with it. Of course, I broke it multiple times by taking it apart and doing stupid stuff. Like, you know, there were cartridges back in those days. You'd plug them in to play games. And I knew so little about technology back then. I thought it was just wire connections on that cartridge port that just caused the games to happen. So I would go to the kitchen and get knives and forks and just start jamming them into the cartridge <laughs> slot. And you would get um, <laughs> you get get all these beautiful colors, and sometimes sounds would come out of it, and sometimes I would blow it up. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dad, it cost you so much money repairing the home computer. <laughs> Um, but you know, my story of getting to where I am today is thanks to a lot of mentors and, you know, really it starts with my father, but around the same time I ran into my first like, uh, <clears throat> engineering and highly technical mentors. Um, I was at the local library looking at the like, three books on electronics that they had there and two ham radio operators were just hanging out at the library and started talking to me and, I was just so excited to meet anybody else in the world that was into electronics. So I glommed onto them and they became my best buds. And they, they taught me all about electronics. They gave me my first oscilloscopes and all these tools, all this junky hand-me-down stuff, but started to teach me the fundamentals of technology. And uh, uh, so that, that's pretty exciting. And I, I at an early age, um, learned an appreciation for mentors and I, maybe not at that time. I didn't understand how, you know, the feedback loops work with mentors, but I just kind of picked it up. It's like, if you're very eager to learn from someone, they're very eager to teach you in most cases. And so that's helped me through my entire career. <clears throat> Sorry if this is going long. Is this okay? No, 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 no. no. A, this is, I'm like, I'm, I'm this watching this like a movie at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So again, I'm this like super geeky kid just into anything science and technology. And of course, what happens to all the geek kids at school, especially in a, a town where um, sports ball is the most important thing, uh, you're the one that gets picked on. So I was that super nice kid that, you know, all the bullies would pick on and they could get me to cry. And it was like a game. And um, leading into my high school years, this was continuing. And then one day I just snapped, like there was this one kid that was bullying me and I was walking across in the front of the classroom and I had a big, um, like math book or something. And he did something to upset me. And I just like, you would throw a discus I had in my hand. I just swung around, hit him across the head, knocked him out of his, his desk. And, uh, just at the same time, the teacher walked in the door to see me doing this. And of course, <laughs> You know, back in those days, they already had the zero tolerance policy. So, of course, I get suspended from school. And again, very um, supportive father. I get, you know, taken home from school. And he says, like, did the kid deserve it? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, try not to do that again. But, you know. <laughs> uh, but when I went back to school, uh, I had this kind of newfound respect, especially amongst all the bad kids and the stoners. They're like, hey, you're pretty cool. And so I, I quickly learned the more wild and crazy I was, the, the more people would leave me alone. And I kind of created this persona hanging out with all the bad kids as the wild and crazy kid, which then led to my first ever career. So I'm, I'm wearing Doc Martens and you know, dark eyeliner and, you know, doing the gothy thing and trying to be bad and getting in kind of minor trouble with the police around town. And, but I had been working at my father's gas station after school and occasionally we would go to the local racetrack that was a few miles away. And I thought that was just the craziest, you know, badass thing that you could ever do. And so I'm like, I want to race cars. And my father had raced cars in the past. I knew that. And I was like, dad, build me a race car. And he's like, absolutely not. No way. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting into racing. I kept begging and begging. And I, this, at this point, I was driving my own personal car. I'd be going to the racetrack. And then I'd be hanging out, you know, after the races and talking to all the race car drivers, trying to, like, 
figure out how you got into racing. This is quarter mile dirt oval. So 20, 30 cars going, you know, between 70 and hundred miles an hour on an oval crashing into each other. A lot of times sprint cars as well. Um, anyway, I started to get, know, get to know people, you know, they gave me some books and I started to learn uh, like how you actually build a car. And I convinced my father, well, actually he, he caved in and he's like, there's only two ways that you're going to get a race car. Either you save up and buy one or you build one yourself. And so this is back in the late eighties, early nineties and minimum wage was like $3 and 50 cents or something. <laughs> so there was no way I was going to be buying a race car. I had to go out and figure out how to build it. So that's when I started hunting for a mentor to help me learn how to do all the machining and welding and things that you have to do to build the car. Plus I was going to the track with my tape measure, <laughs> measuring people's <laughs> race cars, which they got really like bent out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I found this mentor, and again, uh, we lived in this logging town, so there were a bunch of little machine shops around that would service logging equipment, but I ran into this gentleman and had a, this one-person machine shop that, you know, he spent his days in there alone, you know, just welding up stuff for logging equipment, but he was quite skilled. He'd come from Boeing, you know, and um, in exchange for him teaching me how to machine I had to come in on the weekends and he'd put me to work. And it was really a great experience because he would make me schlep metal around, you know, and clean the bed of his lathe and crawl under things and grease and adjust the, the, the gibs on, you know, cross slides and all kinds of stuff. And in exchange, he would grab a chunk of metal and teach me how to tap a hole or weld on it. And um, it was a, a, one of these great feedback loops where, he had all this knowledge and no one, probably no one in his life really cared to talk about this stuff, but I was just eager to suck it all up. He also taught me a kind of a valuable lesson on how um, it's important as you're learning to fail. Cause he was, he was this kind of gruff, grumpy guy that would swear a lot and like pretend to be mad at you when you did something wrong. Like you're going to tap a hole, you're going to power feed, tap a hole or something you set the lathe up and you're going to do it. And of course, you know, I don't know how to do it. It's the RPMs are just way too high. He knows I'm going to plunge this tap in. It's going to snap right off. So then, you know, I'd go and I'd snap one of his taps off in like a piece of metal and he'd be like, ah, God damn it. And, you know, <laughs> but I could see he, he'd be like, you know, kind of smiling. And um, so, yeah, really great guy. And so he let me, let me start building my race car in the back of uh, his shop, uh, which was pretty amazing. And so I started putting this race car together. My father came around and he's like, well, I better get involved because I don't want you to die in this thing. And <laughs> so anyway, this turned into my first career. I started, um, I put this race car together. It sucked. It was terrible. Um, but in my mind, I was going to be the next Mario Andretti. And, you know, I go out to the racetrack for the first time. I was so late to the season that I hadn't even had a practice session. So I just drove it out on the track for qualifying. And I'm like, oh, I'm going so fast and I'm driving it around there. And I come in and I check my time. I'm like slow time of the night by like two, two minutes or something. It was incredibly slow, like, <laughs> but it was a start. And I went out and for my first race and I spun out like on the first lap or something and, you know, got hit head on. And I was like, bonk. I'm like, oh, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> but, but I got obsessed. Um, like, I've got to get good at this. And so there, there was this book that I picked up along the way somewhere. And in the back of the book, it taught you how to build and set up your race car. There was a phone number. It was a phone number directly to the you know, the person that wrote the book. So I was constantly calling this guy in Florida, Duke, like, Hey Duke, you know, it's Jerry again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I raced this Saturday and my car was pushing and it, or it had a bunch of understeer and yada, yada, yada. And he's like constantly talking to me. And he finally, I think he was a little fed up. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
if you can just find a way, and I lived in Oregon at the time, find a way to get out to Florida. Uh, my wife and I will put you up for like a couple weeks and I'll teach you everything you need to know about racing cars. <laughs> so of course I'm like this super poor kid and I jump in a Greyhound bus. So from Portland to central Florida is like five days continuous to get there. That was quite an adventure for someone that was like 17 or 18 years old. You know, the creepers, the <laughs> all kinds of weird stuff going on. But I get there and uh, he became a, a pretty great mentor as well. And he taught me a lot of valuable lessons that have um, gone on to help me in my life. Uh, the first thing he taught me is, you know, if it's not in the rule books, it's legal. So always look for things that aren't in the rules that can give you an advantage. And the other thing that he taught me was, you know, getting into the heads of your opponents, very important. So if you can somehow create an air that you have an advantage or you're better, you know, you'll, um, you'll be more successful because you'll intimidate them. And then the third lesson, he's like, understand the stakeholders around the racetrack. And this is probably one of the biggest lessons that helped me in my professional career as an engineer is like, what are the motivations of everybody around you? So all these little tiny racetracks, you know, what are they, what's their business really? It's not really the racing of the cars. It's selling expensive nachos and beer to, you know, the audience. And so, you know, if you can be an attraction for a steady audience, the promoter and the flagger at the track is going to give you favorable calls out on the track. So you can be more aggressive. And so I started, I came back after going to Duke's, he taught me how to set the car up. So my car started driving better and he taught me how to visualize, you know, an off times like driving the car and getting my head in the right mental state. Plus I started looking for opportunities to get an audience around me that would follow me from track to track so that I get this favorable um, uh, treatment from the promoters. And so as I got better, I started winning all these races. I would get lots of little tiny trophies for winning short little um, races. And it, after a while, they start piling up and I came up with this idea. It's like, why don't I just give it a, give away my trophies to the kids in the audience? That was the best thing I could ever do because I immediately got the kids as immediate fans. <laughs> like every kid in the audience wanted a trophy. And then the parents of the kids loved you. And then I would make an effort whenever I got a trophy, I'd jump, jump across the fence and just find the first kid and hand it to them. And then any chance I got, I would just walk the grandstands and just talk to people and it worked. Um, I could get away with a lot of stuff out on the, the track. Um, I also looked for um, advantages. I engineered my own traction control system. So I, I was into electronics, of course, at this point and pretty skilled. So I made an electronic traction control system for my car, which gave me a huge advantage. I, uh, I put linear actuators on suspension components so I could adjust them when I was uh, during yellow flag conditions and tune my car up on the track. I did subterfuge things like I would, a lot of times on these race cars, you would add ballast to the cars to balance them. Um, but my mentor Duke, he's like, you always build your car on a set of scales when you're doing it. So it's always balanced. So you never have to use ballast, but I decided to put fake ballast onto my car. And if you're successful, people will start to copy it. So I had these hollow tubes <laughs> Sorry, I'm going on and on. No, no, no this no. is we love this it. Is, this is absolute genius. Though. Yeah, I love where this is going to go. I could think. have could have been a pro res pro wrestling promoter with this mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, but you know, these things, these things are. It's like universal. It's almost anywhere you go. Um, these things help you. Um, yeah, just to complete the story because it's kind of funny on the race car stuff. Um, Fake ballast was great because people were trying to copy that. I was doing putting ballast in ridiculous places. So these cars always turn left. So I'd put the weight on the right side up high towards the front, the absolute worst place to put it. 
And of course, you come to the track and people are experimenting, trying to put weight. Another uh, really one that I liked a lot is I put fake brake lights on my car. Um, so there's a psychological advantage to that. So the brake lights would just randomly turn on as you go around the track. And, you know, race car drivers, you know, they spend six days a week, you know, when they're not racing, driving down the road, having to brake and having that psychological you know, intuition to stop when they see brake lights. But I did end up pushing, uh, pushing it too far. You know, a valuable lesson I learned was that uh, promoters also don't like runaway successes. They like the races to be balanced because if there's one person dominating, then they start to lose um, audience. So there, that's why the rules are always there. Try to balance the racing. So it's all really close. So it got to the point where um, doing these things were a detriment and they started banning some of these things like the traction control systems, the brake lights had to go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but that so, was it. Oh, go ahead. Um, so there was no one else doing these things or was this really just you in that area doing, or was it known that people do these, these modifications? I mean, there's a lot of people trying to get an edge, but I mean, this is, country bumpkin racing. So a lot of these dirt <laughs> tracks, a lot of these dirt tracks are in little tiny communities all up and down I-5. So I raced clear up into Washington through Oregon into Northern California. And so it, a, a lot of, I don't want to be too disparaging, but I mean, it's a lot of people just kind of weld a car together, one of these late model cars or a sprint car and didn't put a lot of thought into the technology. <laughs> But I was always about like building and inventing things. So it's like, how can I change it? It was actually very frustrating for my father. Like one year I took second place in the circuit and I had a, it looked like I had a good chance of taking first place the next year, but I had gone over the top trying to like modify my car and do things. And I was constantly like the next year changing the suspension. I made this push rod um, suspension, which broke the first time I went out. So I had a, a DNF. And then I modified it to a cantilever suspension to reduce unsprung weight. And that started working, but it took me a few like weeks to tune it up and ended up coming in fourth uh, that year because I just kept changing my car. Uh, so my father, you know, again, I was this really bad kid getting in trouble, you know, slight trouble with police every once in a while, getting hauled home and handcuffs and stuff, uh, <laughs> you know, total goth. Um, my, my dad, um, was very worried about me, to be honest. And he thought this would be my path in life. And so he was like looking around, trying to get me on a professional race car team. He'd like somehow found a team out of North Carolina where I could just move my move up and become a professional race car driver. Um, but I really wasn't interested in it necessarily for the racing bit. I mean, it my, my heart's pounding right now thinking about how exciting it was to race the car. But um, I knew long-term it wasn't going to be my career. And so like a light switch about four or five years into it, I'm like, okay, I'm done with racing. I'm done with all these knuckleheads at the track. It's not like an easy place for someone like me to be, you know, <laughs> with a very male dominated <laughs> sport. Um, so here comes an interesting transition to where I got to be a real, oh, so I started making tons of money in race cars. I ended up dropping out of high school. So I was making more, more money than a lot of people in my community. I was sponsored by British Petroleum. Um, all the money I wanted at the racetrack, I was uh, able to keep the purse. And then I was also building race cars for other people. So it was kind of a, a little first taste of being an entrepreneur were you building the modifications? <laughs> yes, yes. I was trying to sell like traction control systems. <laughs> that's that's why um, the track found out that I even had the traction control. <laughs> Although they should have known something was going on because the way I did the traction control, and your audience will probably appreciate this because it's so nerdy. Um, this is the early 90s and traction control was like super brand new on streetcars and very complex to do. And I found this clever hack to do it. So on these engines, we use these big 800 horsepower V8 engines. You have to have a rev lim limiter and an ignition system on it to keep them from going past their max RPM or they just grenade. Um, and uh, 
I was like, well, you know what? Um, there's just this little resistor plug-in module that sets the RPM. And there's like these ridiculously low RPM resistors you can put in there, like 2000 RPM. Why don't I just measure the engine RPM? Because we get ran direct drive um, drivetrain on these. So you just put it in go and you're not shifting. So whatever the engine RPM is, is a direct correlation of what the back tires are doing. And then I put a hall sensor on the, the front tire so I could measure the RPM of the front, made a little 6502 single board computer, wire wrapped it all together. And I just measured engine RPM versus uh, front tire spin. And if I exceeded a certain percentage of rear tire spin versus front, I would just click in through a relay, a different chip into this rev limiter. And it would just cut the um, ignition randomly to the cylinders to uh, cut power. And so the side effect of this is the engine sound changes drastically. It makes this really cool, like, you know, you're really high pitch and then it kicks in and you've got this like really bassy sound. And then all this raw fuel starts dumping out your exhaust, which <laughs> is burning. So the exhaust in, in my car went up and over and out towards the audience side. So I'd be going down the straightaway, bumping up against this rev limiter the whole way down and just sh flames would be shooting out of, out of my car, which looked <laughs> really, really cool. And then when I went in the corner, of course, I could hardly spin out because, you know, as soon as the back tires broke loose, you know, the rev limiter would kick in and just big flames shooting out as it's... Anyway, sorry, I'm spending way too much time on race cars, but it was a fun learning experience for me. And clearly uh, an important part of your life. It well, sounds like you yeah, learned a lot. Part of, of the, it's absolutely part of the journey. Yeah, it's how we end up to, to where you are in 2023. It sounds like you learned a lot of life lessons, a lot of... Well, it's, what's amazed me so far is at that stage in life to be so young and to have had already a handful of mentors, each one mm -hmm. becoming a valuable tool. Well, Come and, on. And, you know, again, giving these, these tips that you've, it sounds like you've carried with you the rest of your life. But holy moly, are you uh, a, a race smart... car gangster, though? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, absolutely. I do have an aggressive side. I got, mean, we... Part of it was, you know, I got bullied so hard in school. So I became very independent. And again, my father was always pep talking me. He's like, I'd come home from school, like distraught because kids were making fun of me. And he'd give me a pep talk. He's like, you're tougher than them. You have a thick skin, you know doesn't matter what they say about you. It, just let it roll off, you know, and, and think of it. One of his things is just think of it this way. If they're picking on you because you can take it, they're leaving somebody else alone that it's really hurting. <laughs> I mean, it, it was nice to hear that. It did hurt me pretty bad, but um, it did, <laughs> yeah. it did set me up to be very independent and um, be resilient to people, naysayers, like getting into race cars Everyone thought I was insane. Everyone said, you know, you can't do it. And I get a chip on my shoulder when people tell me I can't do it. And then I just go figure it out, find the people who are going to be supportive to help. And so um, that's, that's how I got into racing and a lot of other things in my life. So after race cars, I just like had my fill of race cars. I was a little frustrated that I couldn't keep cheating. <laughs> well, it wasn't on the rules, so it wasn't cheating, but they kept making mm -hmm. rules and making it cheating. And uh, they made the fun stuff against the rules. Well, you know? you got to feel a little good, though, if, if some of that's a result of things that you did. That... Yeah. And like you said, not something that everybody was doing. It's something that. Yeah, I'd feel pretty honored about yeah. that. Change the yeah. game. You know, there's some, there's some rules that I helped create in the sport. Yeah, unfortunately, the the people that are racing that circuit today are probably still living with rules that were because of me. Like they had, <laughs> I was obsessed with making the car featherweight, so um, my cars were extremely lightweight. I was going to Boeing Surplus, which was nearby up in Seattle, and I would get all of this really exotic material, like honeycomb material. Um, working with my mentor, I learned how to. Uh, well, chrome molly tubing and anneal it. And so like my race car compared to others, my late model car was only 1900 pounds wet and ready to race with me sitting in it, which was probably about 500 pounds lighter than most of the other cars out there, which was just a huge, huge advantage. 
So eventually they put a, a minimum weight limit in too. So <laughs> that was actually the final straw because I was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we're spending so much time being motorheads, but I wish I would have built this. I still think about it today. It was half built. I was going for the lightest car ever. So what I did is I took two Volkswagen uh, transversial piston uh, bus motors, one in the back, one in the front, and I had a synchronizer shaft between them. So you can make quite a bit of power out of these. And it was going to be four-wheel drive and insanely light because it had these two lightweight motors in there synchronized. And then um, as I was building it that winter, it came down that they were going to have this minimum weight limit of like 2,400 pounds or something. It's like, well, you know, I put all this work into this car and it's not going to be able to compete because it's going to you know, have to have an extra thousand pounds on it. Um, but at the same time, this is how I transitioned into uh, my next career, which was also another amazing learning experience. And it was just a stepping stone to um, other fun things I got to do in my career. But I went over to one of my um, buddies from high school and we were hanging out at his house. He had bought his house and he'd got his family going at this point and he had a man cave and in the man cave he had and this is around 1995 uh he had a 486 computer that he had assembled and so he had tricked a parts wholesaler to sell him the parts wholesale and um he's like showing me this really cool computer and of course i'm totally digging it i'm into computers and he's like this computer i paid about 600 dollars in parts but normally this sells from for like 1500 to $1,800, but because they think I'm a, a, a reseller of computers. <laughs> and of course, my entrepreneurial light switch went on. I'm like, that's really good margin. And, you know, this is uh, right just before Windows 95, you know, is coming out. There was a lot of buzz about that. And people were like streaming to AOL like crazy. I'm like, let's start a business. I've got this money. Um, I'll just sell off everything I have, you know, associated to racing. Let's start a business. And then just keep in mind, I'm like this gothy Doc Martens wearing kid. And we we start this business. I, I fund the entire business. Uh, we get all the inventory in there. We get a storefront. We get a sign. And, and uh, uh, he was working as a locksmith and he couldn't quit his job because he had a kid and everything. So it's like, okay, I'll bootstrap the store. You come in on weekends and evenings and, you know, let's, you know, help out. So the, it starts to take off. We, we start to become, you know, successful. He was able to quit his job and join, but then that's when everything went sideways. I, I was swearing like a sailor. I didn't <laughs> really, <laughs> I didn't have any relatability with customers. And so he was super frustrated with this and ended up uh, hiring a lawyer and booting me out of the business, which was devastating. And, uh, business so, is ruthless. That was the, <laughs> that was from the, the race car world to the business world. One Oh one. Yeah. Yeah. So in like <laughs> eight months or something, I'd like lost all of my life savings and, you know, and I was so young and naive. I didn't know what to do. Right you know, just like lawyer coming in and saying like, you're out. And it's like, so of course I go to my friends and family and father and like, you know, I'm distraught. I'm like, what do I do? And, you know, of course my dad is, and everyone's saying like, oh, it was a good run, you know, you know, the racing was a good run and everything, but you should just go back to school and then go to college and get your life going. But I go back to my apartment and I get mad and here comes my vindictive side. <laughs> like, I'm like that effort can't do this to me. <laughs> so I start scheming a plan. Like, how can I put this guy out of business? <laughs> and, and so I call my landlord up and I'm like, is there a way for me to break my lease and get my deposit back? And they were very um, generous. To let me do that. So I got my, uh, my deposit back on the, the, apartment found a little it was a one it was a little tiny place it was a one chair barber shop that had gone out of business so i rented this place with the money that i had from my apartment started living in the back took the barber chair and unbolted it from the floor and dragged it out in the alley and left it out back for someone to steal and then 
managed to scrape together just enough money that I could, you know, get some like slot board for the walls to like put shelves up and stuff like that. But now I'm completely broke. I didn't have any money. So I came up with this scheme to make it look like I had product. So I would go to my business part, ex-business partner's dumpster, you know, and over a matter of days, I collected all the colorful boxes from the dumpster and stuck them all over the wall. (laughs) So I had no inventory, just a bunch of empty boxes on the wall. And, um, and I just set out, I'm like, I'm just out to crush this guy and I won't, even if I lose money selling something, I just want to make sure I'm always cheaper than he is. <laughs> so um, anyway, people would wander into my store and they're like, oh, I want the sound blaster card and point to the thing on the wall and be like, well, that one is reserved. But if you put half down, I'll get you one. And then I, I would like rob Peter to pay Paul. I'd get enough so that I could order the parts. And uh, people were okay with that because it was much cheaper and I would just, was making razor thin margins on everything. Um, but this is when another mentor stepped into my, my life, which was very fortunate directly across the street from uh, my computer store was an insurance salesman who was interested in computers and was also very kind. He saw that I was like withering, uh, away cause I was eating <laughs> ramen noodles every day. So on his lunch break, he would come over and he would bring me like, you know, whatever McDonald's or something and sit with me. And this is where you know, he was very kind. And he started talking about relatability. He's like, you know, he learned my story and everything. So I, I know, I understand why you're doing this and you have friends that are, are like this, but there's this thing called relatability. You know, when customers come in, you know, they need to trust you. So you should probably look the part. And, you know, it, And I admired him because he was quite successful, one of the successful business owners in town. So I started making small changes in my appearance and learned to not swear so much in front of customers. And holy cow, you know, it kind of works when you kind of look the part, you know, people trust you. And the business started taking off like, like mad. Um, So I I think within a year, I had pretty much crushed my um, business partner, uh, ex-business partner. (laughs) He was out of business. (laughs) Um, and things were like taking off. I was starting to hire my first, uh, employees and it was, it was perfect. It was like 1996, just everyone had to have a computer. People were ordering parts in bulk from us. Like, and I had like, I became a little mini distributor for people in town. Like if like some guys like, yeah, I build computers in my garage. Like, oh, great. I'll give you 20% off. You'll get wholesale pricing. And so um, anyway, people would line up and each week we'd get these big pallets of like components and people would be lined up around the block and we'd be breaking down the pallets and like handing video cards out and checking things off lists. It was really exciting. Started opening other stores in nearby communities and eventually had five stores. It was just going great. Um, some of the lessons I learned uh, pretty early on is how to assemble a really amazing team. So, you know, I had heard back in the day that you probably should like hire people that went to school for assembling computers and things like that. Turns out that they weren't always the best employees. What it turns out, hire people that would just do it for fun and uh, they'll love what they're doing and they'll do a great job. And uh, uh, that's what we did. We were just a bunch of passionate kids that loved to build computers and we'd do land parties and we even opened our own <laughs> gaming center next to a college and we just loved every bit of it. Um, this also, um, now I'm, I'm starting to make a lot of money at this point. And so that opened up opportunities for me to really focus on my hobby of electronics. So I was able to buy expensive tools and CAD packages and and different things. And I started on the side learning about like these FPGA chips and making circuit boards and just doing this. So for a good five years, I was just, you know, in heaven, you know, just everything about my life was just ideal. But um, year 2000 rolls around, Y2K, right? It's going to, you know, the world's going to come to an end. (laughs) And, uh, 
Yeah, and we're selling computers like crazy because everyone's upgrading. After Y2K, sales went to basically zero. Everyone had upgraded. Gateway computers, Dell computers are now selling like $200, $300 PCs, and our margins just went to nothing. And we started hemorrhaging money like crazy. And so this is another valuable lesson I learned because I was too dumb and naive. Um, and I, I've seen people do this wrong so many times in startups. I was, I had extreme transparency with everybody in the company. So as soon as things started going sideways, I just started telling everyone like, you know, we're going to be out of money in a couple of months. Um, you might want to start like looking around if like your family really needs this money. Cause I don't know how we, we solve this, but I'm, I'm looking for ideas. Let's all like, go to the mat if you want and try to save the computer stores. And, you know, a couple people left. I probably had, you know, a dozen or 15 employees, but not too many people left. Everyone else rallied. We tried all kinds of things that, you know, kind of extended the life of the business. Like we got into selling cell phones and satellite dishes and, you know, doing network installs. And it was really heartwarming to see like how everyone wanted to, the good times to last. <laughs> and uh, it, it, things worked here and there, but it really didn't, you know, we were just scraping by at this point. And it got to the point where I'm like, this is just not going to work for me. So I went to all of the employees and I'm like, here's the deal. If you want the stores, they're yours. Just pay me for the inventory. If you can down, down the road, if you want to make it go. Go at it. And we showed, closed down two of the stores and three of the, uh, you know, three of like the managers kept the stores going and I never got my inventory, which is fine. <laughs> but what's really cool is one of those stores is still around today in Canby, Oregon. Um, wow. I, I assume uh, last time I was up there, I drove by. I'm like, oh my God, it's still there. It's still there. <laughs> they figured it out. I actually, I walked in like one of my obsessions when I was at the computer store at, you know, after we had like five of them, I would just kind of circulate between the stores and hang out at the different stores, but it was facing the shelves. Like I just had this thing, like the shelves have to look neat. So I'd face everything. So a couple of years ago, I went up to Canby and I just walked in the store and whoever was working was in the back and I just started facing the shelves. <laughs> And they came out and took a look at me. I'm just like, hey, just looking around. Yeah. Just some See? new employee. Probably had no idea who you were. Yeah. So then, of course, my computer stores are failing. I go to my friends and family and father and like, what should I do? And they're like, <laughs> my dad's the same old broken record. He's, it's always out from a good place, right? He's like, that was a good run. You know, you're still young. <laughs> Get your GED. Go to college. You know get your life on track and, you know, do engineering or something. And uh, I was like, well, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I think I could just bust into Silicon Valley because I'd heard all about <laughs> Silicon Valley. You know, you hear these stories of college dropouts, you know, and, you know, the Wozniaks and the Steve Jobs and stuff like that, that just, just do Burst it. through. Like, like, well, maybe I can do that. So I still had a little bit of money from the computer stores and I started flying to Silicon Valley from the Portland area where I was living at the time. And I would what go year to, is this now? Uh, mid-2000, um, 2001, I forget. So I started coming down to Silicon Valley. I started going to every trade show I can, every event, and just started connecting to people down in Silicon Valley. And of course, I was pretty poor. So... I would just sneak into a lot of these events like embedded systems <laughs> conference. I would just, I, I, uh, there was, gosh, I'm, I'm going so heavy on mentors and I apologize if I'm boring no, you all, but not at all. There's this lady who I helped her out on the weekends. Occasionally when I was a teenager, she's an older lady. She was amazing. Um, during world war two, she was a psychologist and helped the military train personnel to look for silhouettes of airplanes so you could shoot down the correct, the enemy airplanes and not the, the, uh, allies and stuff like that. But she used her psychology background to 
make this training material later on. She went on to uh, create like the bitone or tritone um, sirens on emergency vehicles because a lot of emergency personnel would crash into each other because all the sirens sounded the same. And she just did amazing things throughout her, her life. But she would have me come over and like lift things and move things around for a few bucks. And I think it was mostly because she wanted some company. So I just hang out with her and she would pass on her wisdom to me and tell me these amazing stories. But one of the things that she taught me that was helpful in this, like getting into trade shows is act like you belong. Just go with gusto head in the air, like looking at people. And she would always do that. She'd be like, like let's go downtown and get ice cream and she'd just barge to the front of the line kind of rude i guess but you know barge (laughs) to the front of the line like i belong up here and like hi joe whatever i'm here for my ice cream and yeah anyway uh, megan sano um amazing lady uh it's really you know what's humbling is a lot of these mentors that helped me along the way the machinists the ham radio operators megan they're all long gone and I really wish I could go back and thank them for like planting the seeds that helped me. That's kind of humbling. Hopefully I can do the same and plant some seeds for other people. So when I'm long gone, but um, yeah, the anyway, remains. yeah, that's what it's all about. Right. Um, so anyway, I bust into these trade shows and go with gusto and just walk past the, um, the door guards and stuff. And I would just go in and I would shake everybody's hands that I could and just find out who they were and what they were all about. And I had a little duffel bag full of circuit boards that I designed. Like back in the day, it was difficult to drive LCD screens, but I'd made a little FPGA to drive LCD screens. And I had video controllers and sound controllers and, and uh, input controllers and stuff. And anyone that would look, I'd be pulling these circuit boards out. Like, look at this. I designed this. I designed this. Are you guys hiring? And I got dozens and dozens of interviews, um, which meant these interviews uh, never went well, at least for the early part. So I was living in Portland. If, after the show, I'd have to fly back down for the interview and they'd usually cut me off because I had this resume. I tried to make it look as good as possible. Like, yeah, race cars and computer stores <laughs> and look at all of these things I've designed. But they'd usually get in there and they'd start asking questions like, where'd you go to school? Like, what engineering jobs have you ever done? And they would just cut me off. It was always frustrating. You'd get like one or two interviews in and then they'd cut you off. And it's like, oh man, I just spent $200 to fly down here just to get cut off after one or two interviews. Uh, and that went on dozens of times. No one wanted to take a chance on me, but there was this, this one founder of a startup that, you know, I got to know at one of these events and he's like, it seems like you're perfect for our team. I just love that you just go for it. He's like, come down and interview. And at this point I was back to taking the Greyhound bus between <laughs> Portland, <laughs> like a 24 hour trip to get from Portland to San Jose. So, you know, I come down on the Greyhound bus you know, go to the bathroom and brush my hair and try to clean up and, you know, de-stink a little bit. And then I find my way over to the interview and uh, got cut off on this particular interview. And I was walking down the stairs out of the building and up comes the stairs, the um, founder of the company is like, hey, Jerry, you know, where are you going? I'm like, well, they said they didn't want to continue the interview. And he's like, wait, what? He's like, have you talked to so-and-so? Have you talked to this person and that person? I'm like, no, no. He's like, come with me. And so he dragged me upstairs. He called all the engineers in and he hosted a panel interview for me and just unilaterally hired me. And that was my big break for like $13 an hour. So, (laughs) (laughs) oh my God. I mean, it's just... it's better than nothing. It was a chance, right? Yep. And so I took it very, very serious and I worked so hard for this person. And, oh, but it was $13 an hour, but I convinced them to let me work remote and that I would just fly down occasionally to meet with the team and they would pay for the flight. So I felt right, like that's, I, that's I, not I, bad. That saves the Greyhound hour trip. You know. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm sure that recruiter must have felt like an idiot too. Who who was that conducting the interview that cuts you off? But you know the founder wants you. You know. Oh, that'd be painful. Mm. Why yeah. you come walking by with the founder and then a team yep. of engineers? Yep. Like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so I took it very serious. I worked day and night. I didn't actually charge them for every hour that I worked because I didn't know a lot of what I had to design. So I was learning it on the job. So it was a very fair trade. And so I was able to, I actually have one of the boards. I stumbled onto it recently. I need to frame it and put it up at the office as a reminder. But, you know, the original board that they had designed cost something like $50 or $60. I was able to get it down to like three or $4 for the board. And in fact, they're still selling these devices today, um, which is really cool. And, uh, but that was my stepping stone. So I did that one contract job and got to know a ton of people. So when I was down in Silicon Valley in the evenings, I would go to every meetup and just meet as many people as possible. And really cool things started happening. I started to get kind of a crew that would, we would go from startup to startup and solve these tough problems really quickly for, for founders. And uh, we were just jumping all over the place and we just kind of piecemeal together teams and, um, oh, sorry, if you guys are up for it, I have a, a, a kind of funny story leading up to my first gig that. Absolutely. Um, I just remembered this. This was, so I was so poor trying to get my first gig. I had to take a minimum wage job at an electronic store in Salem, Oregon. And so I went to the manager and said, like, I just need a like really flexible work schedule and because I really want to get a job down in Silicon Valley. And he agreed to it. He's like two or three days a week I could come in and work. But I had like five years of retail experience at my computer stores, like really, really good at upselling people and stuff. Like, so I started this electronics store selling components. It's like a giant radio shack type thing, but it, um, and so people would come in, they'd have their little projects. And so I was naturally interested in what they're building. I'm like, what are you building? And they're like, I'm building this widget. And I'm like, oh, have you thought about doing this circuit design? Do you have an enclosure for it? We have like really great enclosures over here. You know, you got to get some battery connectors for it too. And here's all the jacks. And people would be walking out with like big arm loads of like components and stuff they never even realized they wanted. And so this manager of the store for all the salespeople, they had this little chart, like who's the highest salesperson of the week. It's like first week there. It's just like, I'm working a couple of days and it's just like, whoosh, I'm like 10 xing everybody. <laughs> and uh, people, people would come to the store and then leave if I wasn't there. And <laughs> so the, the manager is like, we need her there more. And he tried to do this power play of like, I'm going to fire you if you don't come in for more hours. I'm like, okay, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, so yeah, it gives you a little color in like how chaotic and rough it was just trying to manage all this stuff and stay alive. But anyway, we got this crew and I did a bunch of projects and it was really fun. And uh, my big first big break came a toy company approached me because I'd done a couple like reverse engineering projects on the old Commodore 64 and posted them online somewhere. And someone heard about this reverse engineering I was doing. So I was taking the chips out of the old Commodore 64 and sticking them in these modern FPGAs so I could make real Commodore 64s on a chip. And uh, they approached me and they're like, we want to make a joystick that has all your favorite Commodore 64 games from the 80s. We've been trying to do it with like these cheap Nintendo on a chips out there, but we can't get the same quality as the Commodore out of um, emulating. And they said, can you make a custom chip for us? So I've been doing a lot of FPGAs up to this point, which are these reconfigurable chips that, you know, they're not very risky to program because if you make a mistake, you just reprogram them. This was, they wanted a full custom chip. So it goes to a foundry, all the metal and all the layers get put down and forever. It's this thing. You got to do it right. And they're like, can you do this? I'm like gulp. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, can you do it in a year? And I'm like, 
Yes. <laughs> I had never done a full custom chip. So, you know, a group of us got together and uh, two folks were working or three folks were working on kind of the software aspect to like make all the loaders and stuff. And then I got to work on all the hardware. So I made an FPGA emulator board and got it out to the programmers. And I started reversing engineering the Commodore 64, which is a really weird beast in like every clock cycle and timing has to be perfect or these games don't run properly. So I'm reverse engineering to like the nth degree, you know, every single clock cycle in this. And we're getting late in the year. They need to go into production in the summertime. And they're like, you, you've got to release this chip. And of course, we're working with this company called Atmel that was going to do the chip design for us. And I had to eat a bunch of humble pie when I went to talk to them. I'm like, guys, I'm in over my head. You know, I've never laid out mm -hmm. a chip before. So I'm getting taught in real time how to do layout from these poor engineers at Atmel <laughs> while I'm doing the actual design. You know, I got into this cycle of like sleeping for one hour, waking up for like five or six and sleeping for one hour. Toy companies breathing down my neck. You got to get this chip out. The poor programmers that are using the FPGA emulator board didn't even have color video out of this thing until like a week before we taped out. I kept telling them like, trust me, the color is coming. Just set aside like one day to adjust the color lookup tables. It, trust me, it's coming. And <laughs> I was just figuring it out on the, on the way. Anyway, we were so late <laughs> that the toy company had to just produce the chips with no test chips. And so they just made 250,000 of these chips or 150,000, I can't remember, millions of dollars worth of chips, send them over to China. They bond them onto the circuit board and they didn't work. And so I get this angry call from the executive from the toy company screaming, like, you've ruined me. Ah, you, know, you need to figure this out. I'm like, you know. I'd never made such a big oops moment in my life before. And I, he's like, you're getting on a plane going to China and you're going to figure this out. And I seriously was considering like, is there, do I have to run from this guy? He is so mad. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> at, at this point, I don't think I'd ever been out of the country or my passport was, exp yeah, I hadn't been out of the country. So I had to get a rapid like overnight passport, get on a plane go to China for the first time. It was, uh, it was super exciting and scary. And I get over there and we get to the factory and they have a, the first couple hundreds of, of these joysticks. Um, oh, I didn't even describe them very well. The, the joysticks have all your favorite video games. You put your batteries in the bottom and you plug them into a television. That's how this With like the, the red, green, and blue. I'm sorry, uh, red, green, yellow. Sorry. Yellow yeah. and red, uh, red, yellow, white. Yeah, my yeah. goodness, it's been like ten years. Or yellow, Since, red. Yeah, I swear I bought in one of these like the thirty in one. Type. Yeah, I yeah. don't know if there was multiple brands of them by the time it got kicking. You kind of referenced the beginning. Once one person does it, everybody loves to mimic. But I remember these being mm -hmm. very popular. I don't know, maybe like I did. Geez, I did mid about two thousands. Uh huh. Yep. This was two thousand three. Um, a bunch of those are mine. I, I did a bunch of those what, for a couple of years. Was there a bunch of copycat ones as well? Yeah. Or? Yeah, there was okay. Atari. I didn't do that. Um, I did the Williams. I did Capcom. Ooh. I did Golden Tea. So I can guarantee Commodore. I had one of the, the the products. I was The reason I was asking about mimicking, I was like, can I say I had one of hers for sure or not? But I'm, I'm pretty confident <laughs> I did at this point. No. Oh. Thanks. I never got they my were, royalty on it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were a common Christmas gift in my youth, especially with amongst all my friends and stuff like that. Everybody got one of those at some point. Yeah, it was a fad that came and went really fast. I mean, there was like two or three years that we were just cranking those things out. Mm -hmm. And then the not <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> There's there's one that I really wanted to do, but I, that's a different story. All we all had it working, but there was just no market left for it. But we'll save that so for you... the next podcast. But anyway, <laughs> we go to China. I go to China, and uh, I get to production line. There's a couple hundred of these things sitting there, and they're all dead. And so we open one of them up, and I look at the circuit board inside. I'm like, 
that's not the circuit board layout that I, I sent to you. And they're like, oh, we cost reduced it. Like, oh, <laughs> and this is actually one of the- That's you know, why it doesn't work. <laughs> this is one of the, my mentors, a ham radio operator. It was like one of your best uh, diagnostic tools in electronics is your finger. So start touching things. And I just start touching like stuff on the circuit board and it like bloop, booted up. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. Um, so they'd, they'd taken all the capacitors off the board because, you know, capacitors are a penny a piece. And, you know, they'd done one test with my FPGA prototype that had eight layers and was had a perfect power supply, didn't need capacitors. But when you're doing it on crummy toy grade circuit boards, you do need those capacitors. <laughs> anyway, boom, great. And it's like, all right, uh, my... My life is saved. And so I was there. I, I was there for a few days. I was hanging out, helping them uh, on the pilot run. And so I had coordinated with the programmers to add some Easter eggs to this thing. And so on the circuit board, I wanted test points you could solder to to hook a keyboard up to it and a disk drive and ways to load your own games into it. And the programmers wanted to add some games and pictures and fun stuff to it. So they added this secret menu. If you wiggle the joystick when it starts up, you drop into the secret menu. So I'm on the pr production line with some of the toy guys, and I wiggle the joystick, drop into this menu, and I'm going through all of the, the things in the, in the menu. And the toy guy's like, what? What is that? I'm like, oh, we added a few things. Tell me what you added immediately. <laughs> I'm like, well, there's a picture of us drinking beer with this famous programmer. There's a game where you jump off of the top of a cliff and you have to do the right number of back dives and land on the rocks below and do a death twitch to get the highest points. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, we're going to lose our ratings for children because of this. Like, you cannot tell anyone about this. And so when I get back home from China, my answering machine is full. And this is back in the days of landlines from this toy executive that was already mad because he thought I screwed up the chip. Now he's mad that, you know, maybe he can't sell these things to kids under a certain age. Mm -hmm. Which as I said, I was, I was like 10 years old, maybe in uh <laughs> at that point. And that was my age group getting them. So yeah, kids were definitely the target market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he's like, you're ruined. You're done in the games <laughs> business. You're never going to do a toy again. And definitely not for us. And, you know, he's, you know, posturing all over the place. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm feeling really bad. And he's like, I should sue you. No, no, he wasn't. No, no, they weren't suing at that point. Um, at that so, point. <laughs> so anyway, the person I was dating at the time was really, you know, good with um, kind of spoofing web uh, web pages and stuff. I don't know anything about web, but he was like, well, if you're do done in the toy industry, you might as well just leak out like how to get into this special menu. And <laughs> yeah. And he convinced me to do it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Fuck those guys. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> and so he made this blog post. It was supposedly this um, line worker in China that liked to hack on toys and he fabricated like all these blog posts. And of course the last one is this Commodore joystick. Like I'm working on this thing. It has some really cool Easter eggs in it. And so he somehow gets it on the front of slash dot, which was like big at the time. And the thing just like three or four days before uh, the thing goes for sale, just goes completely viral. People are like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And now I'm getting phone calls from that mad executive from New York. Like, now we're going to sue you for this. And like, oh, man, I really put my foot in it big time. Um, and what was weird is they were selling these through QVC. And so their first um, retailer was QVC, which is like a lot of grandmas and grandpas just buying like overpriced junk there. <laughs> And so I tune in on launch day and they had gotten this um, as like the daily value. So like every hour they had a paid actor that would come in and demonstrate the toy for five minutes and sell it. And this actor didn't know how to use the thing at all, like barely could get into the games. It was atrocious. And then like their 
the ways that we're trying to sell it to grandma and grandpa were like, look at those colors. Your grandkids are going to love it. We have a two pack version. Just think you can send the kids home with one and you can keep one here. Your grandkids are going to love you. Look at those colors. And I'm like, but because it had gone viral and they were only selling in North America um, and they had failed to take me off of the communications with QVC, I got to see what was happening in real time, which was really, really cool. So at midnight, you know, U.S. time, these things start like selling like hotcakes, like 10,000 at a time, just like crazy. They're just selling, selling, selling. And they're all confused. They're like, we don't know what's going on. Like 50% of these are going overseas. We, we never sell items like this at midnight and three in the morning. And they ended up selling out like hundreds of thousands of these things in like less than a week. And the funny thing is this uh, toy guy calls me up like a couple days into this and he's I, I love him to death. He's a mentor. Still, he helps me out today, but he's just like, way to go, kiddo. Way to go. <laughs> Always forgiven. Always forgiven. Uh, so, yeah, I went on to do, you know, a dozen toys or so, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, that, and that put me on the, the map. Uh, New, York, <laughs> New York Times picked up on this and they wrote this beautiful article, um, a toy with a story. So they just they just wrote a story about me and put it like in like a front page New York Times thing, um, which was really interesting. I was on a plane flight and I look over and I see my face, you know, <laughs> on a New York Times. And this is before social media and things just go crazy for me at that point. Like people are trying to contact me all over the place. Um they're calling my father because they couldn't figure out how to contact me. Like job offers are rolling in that really catapulted my career into doing a lot of cool things. Um, I, honestly, I'll speed this up. I'm sorry. I feel like we've been going no. for three hours now. <laughs> oh my God. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, in, I'm it's been glued. Quite, it's a good story. You I'm know? glued to the camera on this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so that led to really fun things. I got to do custom chips that ended up in the TiVo after that. I did um, navigation systems for lower Earth orbit rockets. So the Astro rocket that flew sideways a few years ago, that was under my flight computer control. Um, we made it to orbit too. <laughs> um, but then I started working with a company that was doing video streaming gear. So back in the olden times, there was a computer called Amiga and they had a thing called a video toaster, which was the first kind of consumer grade or low cost video switcher. So you could do editing a video without like having a full studio. They became a very big company. This Amiga computer goes out of business their Commodore goes out of business. And then a few years later, they want to make a PC version of it. So they hired me to make, help make this card that you could do video streaming, you know, in 2007 or so, uh, video streaming was extremely difficult. Like you couldn't just go get OBS and do it. You needed kind of dedicated <laughs> hardware. So I started working on this, built this, this capture card thing. And, and I'm like, well, I should figure out what this live streaming stuff is all about. So I had a really nice workshop at home. So I just set up one of our rigs and I'm like, I'm just going to live stream my workshop 24 seven kind of everyone thought I was insane. Um, and they just hundreds of people just started like gathering around my live stream and we built up a little text to speech ways for them to control pan tilt zoom cameras. And it was a really neat experience. Like, you know, doing kind of a co-development on things with hundreds of like, nerdly internet folks that just wanted to hang out now now today today streaming's nothing it's not weird at all but back then my colleagues are like you are so weird <laughs> uh, but um yeah it was fun i'd be like working on a circuit and sometimes i'd have to block it off because it was for, for a client but i'd be working on a circuit or something and be like gosh what's the pinout for a 74 ls04 and then like within seconds, someone would be like, pin one is ground, pin two is, <laughs> it was really neat. But then that, that led to you, uh, me 
starting up a little YouTube channel and then this comes back to mentoring. I'm like, I love all the mentors and the mentors around Silicon Valley that have helped me out. Like maybe I can give back in a way. So I started doing little short back when you could only do what five minutes or something on YouTube, these little short five minute engineering science uh, YouTube videos. I was just doing tons of these things and putting them up and uh, got a little bit of a following around all my weird YouTube videos. Um, and that drew, and this gets, I'm sorry. Okay. This gets to XR. This is like, this all <laughs> led up to XR. Well, again, that's how we understand the 2023 product of Jerry <laughs> Ellsworth, you know? So I, I spent years making YouTube videos, doing all kinds of interesting projects across all different types of fields, learning about making consumer products, doing, you know, really high tech, um, you know, chip designs and things like that. And then out of the blue, I get, I start getting messages from people at Valve Software. And I kind of knew of Valve Software and they're like, we want to start a hardware department. We think you would be perfect to run it. I'm like, oh, no, I'm busy with another contract now. I really can't do it, you know, and I'm not really into, I, I don't know, software companies doing hardware, not my thing. <laughs> and then I collect pinball machines. I was going to Maker Fair. I was going to all these different events, like the pinball shows. I'd be at a pinball show and I'd be playing on a pinball machine. And this person would step up next to me and like, hey, you're Jerry, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm Jerry. And like... I'm so-and-so from Valve. We'd really like to talk to you. I'm like, wow, weird. Valve people. And then I'd be at Maker Fair. And then like people would track me down at Maker Fair. They're like, hey, I'm so-and-so from Valve. We'd really like to talk to you. I'm like, I'm busy. I'm busy. So they stopped me for six months, which was kind of flattering. <laughs> Finally, Gabe reached out to me on Facebook or something and sent me a message. And he's like, hey, I want to fly down to Portland. And I... I want to take you out to lunch. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So he flies down to Portland. We go out to some dive bar and we're sitting in there, me and Kim New. And he's telling me about like, you know, you'd really like Valve and the culture and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, Gabe. It's like, it's a different discipline for making hardware. And uh, he's like, well, just come up, just fly up to um, Seattle and just spend an afternoon with us. I'm like, I'll do that. And so they flew me up. I get there. And he, first of all, he said, it's not an interview. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Show up. And it was a total lie. It was a panel interview, <laughs> which I love panel interviews anyway. So I'm like, all right, challenge accepted. So they're just throwing out all these questions. Like we want to make a game console. How would you go about it? And I'd be like, well, I'd go here. I'd use this contract manufacturer, use this industrial design team. And, and, Anyway, we went back and forth for an hour or two like that. And then Gabe like tugged on his ear or tapped his nose or something. And, you know, everyone got up and left. And then Gabe was like, follow me. He took me down to the fourth floor of the building they were in. And like, this entire floor is yours. You have an unlimited budget. Just hire your dream team. And this is your goal. He's like, I want to bring the entire family together to play games in the living room. He's like, Gamers are in their little silos. You have hardcore gamers. You have people that play certain games. You have casual gamers. You had people that played games when they were kids, but don't play anymore. It's like, this, it's just entertainment. We think that everyone should be able to participate in games. And plus at the time, Microsoft was threatening uh, Valve, their business, their core business, which is Steam. So Steam is the biggest platform for getting PC games. And that's where they make the lion's share of their money. Microsoft was going to shut off with Windows 8 in the Metro interface, the ability to have external stores. And that was a, a threat to, to Valve's livelihood. And so they wanted an escape route. So anyway, I was like, he's like, stay overnight. We want to spend more time with you. And I'm like, well, I didn't bring any clothes or toiletry or anything. And he's like, oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll have um, folks help you out. And so someone picked me up and took me to the swag cabinet or the swag um, room. And they start pulling down like left for dead shirts and portal shirts and valve <laughs> shirts and like, what's your size? And, and, and we'll, we'll take you to a, a store so you can get underwear and toothbrushes. <laughs> and like, okay. So weird. So then anyway, I come back the next day, I'm wearing my valve shirt, like 
I guess I'm doing this right. I'm here and I'm, I show up at the front desk and they're like, Oh, we've been expecting you just go in and like, is someone going to meet me? They're like, no, no, just wander around. And so I just spent the entire day just wandering around. And so inside valve, they have different cabals. This is just where they pair program and they pair people up. It's really cool process where an artist sits next to a technical programmer next to a level designer and they just all the desks roll around and you can make these little cabals and do your your work and i had free reign to go through like you know any room i wanted i kept going back to the front desk like is gabe in yet like what what's going on they're like no no just just have a good time go up to the kitchen wander around talk to people and I'm like okay fine so i'm going through you know Dota and like, Hey, what do you do here? And, um, eventually Gabe showed up and, and I, I had the conversation with him like, so Gabe, I'm doing this contract with this other company. Like I could probably help out a little bit, you know, contract for you guys. He's like, we really want to get going fast. Like, can we just buy you out from that company? Can we just pay them money? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, Gabe, I don't just abandon projects. I can't do that. Um, so I convinced him to let me come on part-time for the f- next three or four months or something. And we got going and it was pretty cool. Um, it was true. They let me uh, go out and you know recruit and spend as much of their money as they wanted. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> we were fly- you know, recruiting people in from all over the world, putting this dream team together. It's pretty amazing. And then just under that mission of how do we bring the family together, plus, you know, how do we um, make an escape route for Valve? Uh, We were doing all kinds of crazy things. We were hooking electrodes to people's brains, or not brains, to their scalp. (laughs) um, Cameras looking at their eyes, reading their pupil dilation, where they're gazing, and electrodes for the resistance of their skin. We're doing AR and VR. We're just buying, like, military-grade equipment and then taking medical tracking systems and gluing them on top of like these super high end VR AR rigs and just exploring everything. Um, and what year would you say this is out of curiosity? 2010, 20. 11, something like that. Yeah. I was, I was looking at some video files. I have a bunch of videos from valve still. And I was kind of surprised how far back some of them go. Maybe someday when the uh, NDAs and <laughs> uh, is it weird? I mean, like what what was VR like at that stage? In obviously military grade, but in comparison to now, like how does it hold up? There were some really good headsets. Um, I imagine they cost a lot too, so that's worth mentioning as well. But yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of this one. I still like it today. Um, it was like ST something, like an ST80 or something. But it used these two eye sucker things that came out. It had an LCOS um, display system, which is 100% fill factor. So you don't have that um, screen door effect that plagued all of the early VR. It may have only been 720p, but um, because it had 100% fill factor, it looked beautiful. Um, but VR back then we were making all the same mistakes that folks that were doing VR in 1983 and they were making (laughs) that, that were repeated again in 1993. And here we're doing it again a a decade or two later. Um, We, we didn't know anything about like locomotion, you know, so we're making people sick like crazy. (laughs) And the rate, the way I put the team together is I assembled the team is like one third researchers, one third kind of like builders and one third product people. And that my idea was like the researchers can like come up with the, the clever techniques and the builders can help both sides, the people that are productizing and the people that are prototyping. Um, but, you know, we had a, quite a few researchers that wanted to understand why people were getting motion sick. So they were doing things like they would invite people down within the company, the developers, like come down and play Left for Dead with full on joystick running locomotion and see how long you can play. We want to see if you can acclimate to the nausea. And of course people would get sick in like 10 minutes or so. And they're like, <laughs> like oh. <laughs> we started having a hard time getting uh, 
test subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we had Dramamine taped to the wall, literally, just as a joke, but not not a joke. Uh, we did some horrible stuff to people. Like uh, there was one, <laughs> there was one test that they put together called the Horizon Tip Test, where they would set the horizon to tip like this, like a ship, mm-hmm. and put people in it and see, like, you know, a little bit of tip is that okay, or a lot of tip and <laughs> insta insta puke. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, we, we quickly, uh, figured out that room scale was super important. So we started putting all of our effort into room scale and that was interesting. This was about the time Carmack and Eribe and Palmer were getting Oculus going. And so Michael Abrash, who was down on the kind of the research side of our team was bringing those guys in all the time, which was causing a lot of conflict because they were coming through brain sucking us constantly. And like all of us on the product side, were like, we're tasked with making a product and you're giving away all of our best secrets to, you know, someone that could be our competition or maybe go to, you know, another platform like (laughs) Facebook that's in competition. (laughs) But of course, like they're like, no, 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 just share everything with, with Carmack. So I had all, I I was always the de facto one that they would bring uh, visitors to. So I was constantly giving tours at the hardware lab. So we'd go over, we'd hook them up to a galvanic skin response system and show them their, you know, response to jump scares. And we'd use AR rigs and VR rigs and stuff. But I remember a couple funny things like Carmack came through and uh, we had this like really heated debate about motion controllers and room scale. I'm like, motion controllers, room scale. That's, that's the future of VR. Trust me. He's like, no, no, no. Gamers are lazy. They just want to sit on the couch. They want a game pad that they're familiar with. It's going to be seated. I am you only joystick. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's gotta be this. Like you had a great time, you know? Mm -hmm. You had a great time in the AR rig too. Like, why are you doubling down on VR also? (laughs) Like, (laughs) anyway, this is where I got the bug for, oh, oh, and to complete the story, of course, what did Oculus come out with first? Xbox controller seated with IMU Mm -hmm. only made, I was so mad. They were just making everyone sick. (laughs) (laughs) And then when Valve came out, you know, with their, uh, the Vive in conjunction with HTC, I'm like, yeah, I showed you guys. I told you. Yeah. Things that break your brain away from being immersed in that environment, like a controller that doesn't move with your arms. That's, that's tough. Or being, getting sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'll do it. Mm -hmm. Still not fully solved today, which is rough. Um, You know, there's, there's still, I go to trade shows and, you know, people are like excited, like Jerry, look at my VR thing that I made and I, I look at the preview I'm like because oh, no. I'm susceptible to it so I'm like oh no I'll come back later <laughs> looks awesome like it's some flying down a tunnel or something <laughs> twirling upside down I'm like no I don't want to do it <laughs> on the uh, on the positive side when we went to PAX back back in March there's probably only about five or six VR demos there you know of different developers testing out their games but luckily at least for the demos that were there, I wasn't hearing anybody leaving it nauseous or anything. It was actually people yeah, overall mm-hmm. positive. So at least it seems like at least the developers showing it off at PAX, they did a good job, knock on wood, for that year, making it, you know, user-friendly experiences because it makes all the difference. You know, you'll if an experience is leaving people nauseous, people are going to be vocal about it when they leave. They're not going to hold that in. But people are leaving even saying like, oh, wow, I'm not nauseous, you know, so... <laughs> At least we're we're passing that stigma as long as developers continue on that track, you know? Yeah, there was a lot of, um, and I still hear it every once in a while. Um, yeah, for years, they're like, Oculus is like, we just need a higher resolution or a higher frame rate. It'll keep people from getting nauseous. And like, we were just like banging our heads against the, against the wall. It's not frame rate. It's, you know, it's not resolution. You know, it's your vestibular system like you got to deal with that you got to get people moving around or blink jump them to places and 
you know, to have a good experience. So yeah, um, pretty, pretty weird having like those, those folks come through all the time, uh, and caused a lot of contention ultimately got me fired from valve too, but that's, you know, a little later in the valve discussion. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, I, I really bought into Gabe's notion that the whole family should come together. And as much as I like VR in, in doses, it just really has a, a lot of friction for like the whole, whole family. And uh, so I was really doubling down on augmented reality. So I was spending all my time trying to solve some of the Virgin's accommodation problems and making compact headsets for AR. And this kind of leads to the technology inside Tilt 5. It was a total accident how I found it at Valve Software. So, you know, Virgin's accommodation, it, it's all based on where your eyes are focusing at and how your eyes are converging in. And that causes stress on people's eyes. Some people are more sensitive to others. Um, and in VR, you have this fixed focus and almost all AR systems, you have this fixed focus way out at infinity, but when your eyes converge in, you have to trick your eyes to focus at a different level or depth, which kind of, it causes people to want to tap out after 30 or 40 minutes, just because you get so much eye fatigue from that. It's like forcing your eyes to focus at, you know, the horizon and never being able to focus up close on anything. Um, So anyway, I was trying to solve this. I had this optics bench set up with this, all these optical relay lenses and beam splitters and stuff. And I had this beam splitter in and I was trying to do a near eye display. So you have this beam splitter in front of your eyes and you're trying to put the light directly into your eyes. And one day I was like reconfiguring, I put the beam splitter in backwards. And so the image that was being projected, it was actually projected out into the room. And uh, one of my colleagues had a piece of this retroreflective material. And that's kind of the core to the Tilt 5 system is the special optical material. He had a piece of this hanging on the wall and I saw this beautiful image 30 feet away from where I was at. I'm like, oh, that's weird. And then I flipped the beam split, splitter around and you know, carry on trying to like figure out how to make light field displays and, and solve Virgin's accommodation. And, and this went on for months, probably like four months or so. I'm just trying everything. We, we made some really cool AR and VR uh, prototypes that if there was like some <laughs> magic bullet, we could shrink them down. They'd be awesome. Like uh, we did uh, direct retinal scanning, which looked absolutely beautiful. It had zero persistence, had one scan line of latency because we'd race the beam down. Um, we were rendering one scan line ahead. And uh, it was this big apparatus. We called it the telescope. And you'd look down this optical barrel and you can move it around. We had this like thousand hertz medical tracker hooked up to it. And it was just, it felt like you were looking through like a telescope, no matter how fast you moved it. It was locked to the world. I don't know if you've ever noticed in VR, if you like tip it up and you kind of move the headsets around, there's, you know, it's stable in the headset, but things aren't really perfectly locked to, you know, spatially in the world. That's the tricky bit with, with AR and VR is like, once you start to blend to the real world, making that stuff look absolutely locked. And uh, yeah, anyway, you just kept working on that stuff. And then one day I was at my house, just like frustrated, like I can make a great AR or VR system if I had a lot of space. Like if I had the size of a refrigerator, I could make the world's best VR or AR system. And we've all heard the stories of like the big giant rigs that Magic Leap that they use to raise all their money. The, the challenge is when you have to squish it down and put it on your face, like there's, you can't bend light like that. The laws of physics are just, yeah, preventing you from uh, doing that. But I made the realization like, hey, that weird material, like what if I just make the optical path between the table and the headset, That's make that the space for the optics. And so that's what I did. I made a prototype where you actually project the light field out to the special retroflector, which then does a 180 degree turn. The light that strikes it just goes directly back to where it comes, which is the user's headset. You can have any number of users around. And so I whipped together a prototype and it worked beautifully. And it was really easy to extrapolate like, you know, this kind of chunky prototype I built, like, oh yeah, we could shrink this thing down to nothing in time. There's no limitations on the constraining the optical path. 
So it's just all about the image generators. How small can we get those? And made prototypes. People liked it. Um, we made this really cool. I made this really cool um, motion controller. It looks very much like our wand. That's why we still kind of have this inspiration. It was actually, you know, I wanted something that was like a magic wand with a trigger button. And I found a electric toothbrush that I could cut apart that had the right ergonomics on it. And then I took a telescoping antenna out of like an AM radio. Those ones that you can open and close. And I put one of these uh, magnetic tracker on the end of it so that you could extend it out. And that was your six degrees of freedom. Plus you had some buttons and joysticks hooked to this electric toothbrush. And that became our input uh, to a lot of things for a while. And people would come down to the AR lab and just spend hours playing like the dumbest games. Like we'd have like shoot fireballs at each other and try to block it or lead your character through a maze and try to shoot each other. Almost zero gameplay loops, but because it was four or five people sitting around the table, it was super fun. I'm like, okay, this is it. This is how we bring the family together. But at the same time, there was a ton of angst inside the, the hardware team about all of this information getting pitched over the wall to Oculus. And so like all of us that were really on the product side were like, we need to stop doing that. We need to focus on productizing something. And a lot of folks on the, on the uh, kind of research side were like, no, no, it's just good for the world. And, you know, obviously they're going to put their platform on steam once they do it. <laughs> and uh, valve's a funny place. Um, so for those of you that don't know about valve, uh, they pride themselves in having no formal management structure. So no managers, anything like that. So it's kind of almost like Lord of the flies. So you have to lobby people to come work on your project. Um, if you pull someone off someone else's team, they'll probably be mad at you and then you'll have some enemies and it's, a, it's a little dysfunctional that way. And so there's people were having fun with the AR stuff. We were getting traction and that's when, uh, I know who it was. Someone lobbied to, um, get the whole AR team pushed out. Boom. We were fired all in one shot. Ironically, that group that lobbied to get us out, jump ship and went to Oculus and got a big payout a few months later. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> a little uh, finger touching suspicion there, a little beard stroking. You know, I wonder, I wonder what happened there. But you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's probably good. Um, well, it led is, to tilt five. Yeah. Say that. Yeah. This is, it's actually probably turned out for the best um, because mm -hmm. Valve's DNA was not lending itself to actually do what Gabe wanted us to do. You know, at the core, people that go to Valve are pretty hardcore gamers. Like they're, they love Dota, they love working on Dota, Left for Dead, Counter Strike. You know, so as we were trying to before the the big purge, we were trying to come up with projections and plans to launch an AR system, and we just couldn't get any buy off from the kind of pseudo leadership that was, you know, there. Uh, at Valve, uh, it probably would have died. So what happened is, so they have a rule at Valve, um, the person that hires you, fires you. So Gabe was the person <laughs> that was going to fire me. The weirdest layoff I've ever seen in my life. You know, normally you show up one day and your key cards um, shut off and then you get an email like you're now fired or whatever. Yeah, your computer won't turn on, you know. <laughs> Instead, they just let us roam around the building like it was over 30 of us that were all getting fired and we all knew who was getting fired and everyone else knew who was getting fired. And so bizarre, like people are coming by, like, you know, like, so sorry. I don't understand why this is happening. Other people are taking oscilloscopes off your desk and in, in equipment. <laughs> it's like crazy. And my, my, uh, time with Gabe was pretty late in the afternoon. So I'm kind of hanging around hearing like, you know, they give you like an exit package to keep your mouth shut and everything. And I'm hearing what people are getting. I'm like, hmm, maybe not so bad. <laughs> anyway, I go up to, to meet with Gabe and 
uh, I was going to go in and be super aggressive. I'm like, and just give him a piece of my mind. And that lasted for actually a nanosecond as I walked in the door. I said something like slightly aggressive and then it broke down in tears like, I can't believe you're <laughs> killing this project. It's so good. It's so good. Oh. <laughs> anyway, he was quite nice. He was like, I'll always be a fan, but you know, the team has spoken and you got to go. And, and then they sent me down to talk to HR. And this is where it gets really spicy. Um, the exit package for me was extremely small, like a mm-hmm. fraction of what other people are getting. And I talked to the HR person, like, mm-hmm. I know what other people are getting. Why are you doing this? And they're like, well, you really don't have a family and you only, you know, it's, it's not going to be as big of an impact on you. And I'm like, what do you know about my <laughs> family? Yeah. I mean, that, super, super bad. That's not like, right. <laughs> yeah. That's- they literally said, you don't have a family. It's like, well, I don't didn't think I told you about my family. Um, it's awfully but, inconsistent as well. Yeah, it was very arbitrary. I don't know how they decided on that. But they're like, just sign here and you'll get your your money. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, I want what everyone <laughs> else is getting. Oh, oh, I forgot to mention. As I was leaving Gabe's office, I said, "You should sell me the technology." And he's like, "Okay." Mm. So that's how I got the technology. So now this is where it gets really interesting, though. So, of course, I'm in a stalemate with HR. With them That's not- a slick business move on the way out as well, by the way. I don't know what what tempted me to even ask. <laughs> Probably didn't think he was going to say yes. Then I went down... <laughs> with- <laughs> I went down to the hardware lab, and there were still some of the AR folks around. I'm like, hey, uh, Gabe offered to sell us the technology. You want to buy it and do this? And a group of us were like, yeah. And people are like stealing stuff off our desk so we quickly put all the prototypes and everything in boxes and we hid it in a closet and then went home uh this is also the kind of funny thing that led to like even more contention with my me leaving the company is like i brought my pinball collect a bunch of my pinball collection and they were scattered throughout valve's office and people loved them they played them all the time so i'm getting ready to leave and i see people are playing my machine and i'm mad because you know first of all they're screwing up me on my severance plus people are wearing out my pinball machines. So I booted people off the machines and I folded down the head boxes so they couldn't be played. And then um, there had been a little bit of contention when I brought in one of the machines because the hardware lab was on the same floor as the gym. So I thought I have a professional weightlifting pinball machine called hard body. And I put it right next to the, uh, the, the weight room. And I don't know, people got all bent out of sh- sh- shape, like, that's so tacky and inappropriate. <laughs> and so the only machine I left set up was the one that people thought was tacky. <laughs> <laughs> then I took a picture and tweeted it and, <laughs> of like all the pinball machines folded over. I'm like, yep, got fired today. And of course, like all the press had heard about this big purge um, at Valve. And so they started reaching out to me like, what's going on? Can you tell us anything? I'm like, Yeah. I haven't signed that. (laughs) I can tell you. (laughs) So anyway, I just, I shared what it's like inside valve and you know, all the politics and kind of when it's good and when it's bad. And of course the HR department and legal departments reaching out to me as this is all breaking going like, what are you doing? How could you do this? And I'm like, what do you expect? Yeah. (laughs) Why wouldn't I be doing this? I told you what I needed. It was the same as everybody else, so that wasn't given. I thought it was pretty clear. <laughs> and, and amazingly, Gabe stuck to his word. I'm like struggling with HR and the legal department, same legal department that's helping me draft the purchase of the uh, optical technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I ended up never signing. They just they stood strong. Like, the I mean, duality I, of Valve. I mean, I even went to... Um, lawyers like i thought it was just so unreasonable that they would do this and they're like nope uh you know washington's an at will state they could fire you and give you nothing like okay then i will not sign and i will be able to tell my story as many times as i want (laughs) so uh, but anyway it uh a group of us got together we started my first startup And this is where I learned a lot of valuable lessons uh, about what not to do at a startup. (laughs) So 
so Oculus had just done this like kick-ass um, Kickstarter and people are super stoked about it. So we take our technology, we make a prototype and we show it around and then we do a really good Kickstarter. And plus we had the cloud of a bunch of Valve people doing this. And then we immediately raise a ton of money from uh, Andy Rubin, a venture capitalist, the founder of Android Google. And uh, we just had this money like dropped on our laps without like spending much time thinking about what the hell we were going to do. So, and I was too scared and I don't know why. It's the first time probably in my career I was too scared to just do something. I was too scared to be the CEO. So I hired an external CEO to come in and run the company who was quite good, helped us raise this money. But um, once we raised like way too much money from Andy Rubin, things changed drastically. So we had promised, you know, a, a very modest thing for our Kickstarter. But Andy had and his team had other ideas. He wanted a moonshot. And he literally, I know it's very trite to say, but it's like you need a moonshot this thing. It's so good. And so our poor CEO is now going into these board meetings, being pressured into like coming up with plans to like ship a million units the first year. And he's like, that's not how startups work. I mean, maybe when you're at Google doing Android and you have all the infrastructure there, you can do it. But I would have to raise a half a billion dollars to like market and ship out. a. He's like, just figure it out. You know, you'll figure out how to raise the money. Frustrated him until he just like, bailed on us and then this is another lesson i learned it's like in your your startup you need to have some friendly people on your board if you become the minority on the board and someone wants to take you off a cliff they're going to take you off a cliff it got so bad in the board because i was always just complaining like this is the wrong move or just doing it wrong that they actually uh unilaterally just made my votes count for only count in a tie <laughs> So basically, I was just stripped of any power in my company. Then they started bringing in this string of CEOs that would last for a month or two, and then they'd get mad at them, and they'd boot them out, and they'd bring in another CEO. And they started just, like, burning this money like crazy. So, like, when we first got the money, we could have lasted, like, four or five years at kind of the rate we were going as we were developing and growing the team. They blew through it in, like, six or seven months. It was just absolutely <laughs> tragic. I mean, they were doing things like they rebranded the company four times um, and spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just each new CEO or executive that came in just rebranded the company. Yeah. So the company, when we started, it was originally Technical Illusions. Then it got rebranded Cast AR. Then it got rebranded Jillian. And then got rebranded Sitecast. Oh is it God. still around or did it? But I'm guessing it didn't survive the tale of time. Uh, what? Sitecast or? Yeah. No, none guess. of these, none of these lasted long enough to even be announced publicly before they decided either the CEO has got to go and another CEO comes in and decides they have to <laughs> rebrand the company. So uh, a lot of hilarious things happened there. Um, just, but you, we were running out of money. And so we were going to have to lay off like everybody. And I came up with a plan. So I put together a new budget. We still had a lot of money in the bank. If we just trimmed, we had 90 people in the company. If we just trimmed most of them, got back to the core, we could actually go forward and make it, make a go of it. So, and later on, I found out this was, they just gave me this task as a distraction while they got ready to shut the company down. But I came up with a whole plan to save the company and, as I was presenting the plan where it had these glass conference rooms, which you could see over and you could see the monitors. And so in my plan, it had, it was very brutal. It's like, we lay off like 80 people. We do this, we do that. We refocus ourselves on this particular product. Oh, I should also mention on the Kickstarter, um, Kickstarter starters are scary and I'm really happy I've done two Kickstarters now and both of them turned out really well. Um, this first Kickstarter, because Andy Rubin didn't like our Kickstarter product, made us refund all the money. So all that money we took in, we had to give back. Um, so at least at least I'm not on a kick scammer video of like <laughs> <laughs> 
kick scammer videos keep me motivated to get products out the door <laughs> when you do a kick but anyway, I had this, going back to the end of the, the company, I had this plan to save the company, but of course the personnel could look over the window and see what was being proposed. And the CEO, the last CEO was there, was a yeller. He just liked to yell. He was angry all the time. He was constantly yelling at me and people in the company. And he had instituted this thing called 15-5, where you could like constantly like, in, uh, like thumbs up how you're feeling in the, your day-to-day -day work and like type in what you're working on and I feel good or bad. And so all of a sudden in the last couple of weeks of the company, all of a sudden the 15 five went from like an all time low to just like skyrocketed up to happy. And he pulled me aside and took me on one of his infamous walks where he was just going to yell at me the entire time. He's like, you leaked your plan. I know it. I know it. You fucker. You did it. You know? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how do you, I didn't tell anyone about my plan. He's like, I know you did. And he's, and I'm like, how do you know, know this? And he's like, because 15, five is everyone's really happy. <laughs> I mean, that's how out of touch these guys were. <laughs> so anyway, we had to shut down the company. It was tragic. I mean, all of the high paid executives that were getting like four times what I was getting, uh, left like that afternoon. The rest of us, all of like the true believers in the company, we stayed around and we hung out. We went out and got drinks. There's a lot of teary-eyed photos of us out there. And the next day I go into work and I'm sitting in an office of sea of cubicles empty, you know, crying in probably another beer. And then I get this random phone call. I pick up the phone. It's like, hey, it's Nolan. I'm like, Nolan? Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. He's like, I saw a prototype of your technology at some event. It's groundbreaking. It's going to change the world. He's like, I just want to give you a little pep talk. You know, I could see that your company was going to fail by the leadership that was coming in there <laughs> uh, from a mile away. He's like, trust me, I've been in plenty of startups that have had trouble. <laughs> but he's like, I just want to tell you that there's always a way. Just go figure it out. And that was it. It was a very short little like pep talk from Nolan Bushnell. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, like, could it be? I reached out to a bunch of my mentors and advisors and I'm like, could I actually do this? And they're like, heck yeah. Yeah. In Silicon Valley, you know, I think we tanked about $20 million with all of the bridge loans and stuff. Um, like after a $20 million crater in the ground, yeah. Can I really have a comeback? Is my career ruined? They're like, no, no, no. Everyone tanks companies and like 20 million, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> like, like, most entrepreneurs have tanked hundreds of millions before they hit it, <laughs> strike it rich. I'm like, wow. So I start working with my mentors and I reach out to my co my current co-founder and other personnel and like, hey, do you want to do this? And they're like, yes. And they're like, please be the CEO. Like that's what went wrong. And so like, okay, I'll be the CEO. And so we all pooled our money together and we bought the technology again. And that's how Till 5 got started. And so this time we reflected on everything that went wrong at Cast AR and we rethought everything. So Cast AR, we had no plan going into it. It was just, we were writing the hype. So if, if you were to ask someone at Cast AR back in the day, like, what are we building? One person might say like, it's an enterprise tool. Another person might say it's for tabletop gaming. No one knew what we were doing. There was no clear direction. So we spent a bunch of time thinking of like, what can we do that's, excellent and just do that for our first attempt at this and we looked at a bunch of things like oh education is really exciting for me but i don't know anything about it and i hear sales cycles are really long and data visualization is kind of neat but know nothing about it and we just came right back to games like we all know games my co-founders from games we're like okay what's our value proposition for the end user? Let's do personas. We just did all this work and it's like, we focused on like, okay, let's bring the magic of board games to video games. What's great about board games. It's sitting around the table, looking people in the eye, you know, being able to like have this shared space, you know, multiplayer. All right. That's our value proposition for games, you know, holographic, cool stuff you can play around the table. Like, okay, what's our fallback or what's our secondary? And it's like, okay, board games. Let's bring the magic of video games to board games. 
being able to save your games, have tutorials, you know, log people in remotely, you know, having a thousand board games, you know, at your fingertips, you know, things like that. And so those were the kind of what we wanted to coalesce into our first, first product. And we focused on that. And, uh, uh, as much as my advisor said that, um, it wouldn't hurt you to have a $20 million creator. It did, it did a little bit. I mean, <laughs> there's a, a certain segment of investors that come at you a little bit leery, um, if you've lost a bunch of money, but you know, overall we were able to raise money and we did it in very small steps. So we would raise a few hundred thousand dollars with a clear goal, like, all right, these are the things we want to achieve. And then we'll go raise another few hundred thousand. Here's the next goal, the next goal, the next goal. In the early, like the first year or two, we've been going over five years now, which is pretty crazy. Like almost, <laughs> you know, three times what we, uh, at cast AR and haven't even raised <laughs> nearly the same amount of money. It's funny what good leadership will do, you know? But, uh, yeah, we were, we had, uh, near death moments. Um, but we had a couple of rules. We, we, um, kind of set in place. We'll never take bad money. So if there's something suspicious about an investor, we just say no, no, even if we're going to run out of money. So that was one of our rules. We had these near death moments where we were just weeks from running out of money and I had to be very transparent with the team. Like, Hey, you know, really need to get this objective done, but I'm going to do my best to raise the money. And we always raise, raise the money just in the nick of time or, you know, like, okay, we're going to have to take four weeks of furlough because I'm still trying to get that money. And what's amazing is no one left during those kind of early days of, you know, because we had like a clear vision of what we wanted to do. It was really magical. People were liking it when we were demoing it. Then we got to this situation where all investors are like, okay, we need to have product market fit and go to Kickstarter. I'm like, not Kickstarter. <laughs> we tried and tried and tried not to go to Kickstarter because Kickstarter, a lot of your audience doesn't realize that they're buying into an idea of what it could be. And some do, but really you have thousands of people with shotguns pointing at your head. Like, where's my product constantly once, once you do a Kickstarter, but yeah, we were forced into a Kickstarter. It was an all chips on the table moment. Like we built all the hype up to the last minute. We pushed all of our money into marketing. Everyone went on furlough and like either when in our mind, we had like a dollar amount we had to hit, or we were just going to cancel the Kickstarter. And it was like, that's it. It was a good run. Uh, we blew way past that and and things have been really good ever since, <laughs> except for, except for COVID. Well, <laughs> I had to raise money during COVID constantly raising money. Actually, one of my advisors, when we got started, he's, uh, gave me this piece of advice. He's like, you're CEO now. And, uh, do you know what the letter CEO stands for? And I'm like, oh yeah, I know what CEO stands for. He's like, no, you don't cash extraction officer. <laughs> like you need to be out promoting the product, selling the product and raising money. So I only get to solder and play and program on our system on the weekends and all the rest <laughs> of the time I get to, <laughs> to raise to, capital, <laughs> raise capital, constantly raising capital. Um, but yeah, we started shipping the product in September of last year. Um, up until like a few weeks ago, we were perpetually backordered. So, um, we're very That's happy. awesome. Yeah, we finally like got like a, a rhythm where we can. Well, correction for another two or three days, we're back ordered on two and three player kits. I saw that on our all hands <laughs> meeting, but um, they'll be back in stock in a couple days. Congrats again. <laughs> yeah, and it's really all these things that we theorized. We thought about this in advance. It's like, okay, um, we think people are going to want our system for group play, so we have to optimize the system so that it's friendly for families to buy group packs. So we had a price point of $300 in our head and we hit that. So to get started, the base kit is $359. It gets you your first headset and wand. And then every pair of glasses and wand after that's $300. And so what we've been seeing in sales, the majority of our sales are um, two and three player packs. People, people living in the same house, sharing the board. 
Yeah, what's cool is you can invest. It's like a uh, rock band. It feels a lot like rock band to me. It was one of those things that it was a little expensive, right? You had to get all the drums and guitars and stuff like that. And you could be in at six, seven hundred dollars, you know, getting all the fancy stuff. But it was a, an investment for your family to have a, a great weekend or when your friends come over. And and that's what we were hoping for is that people could amortize the cost across how many times they can use it with their friends and family. And that's cool. Um, and then we've been seeing like really great sales into non-gaming. So we try to track and talk to our customers and probably 25% of our sales are going to non-gaming applications. So a lot of really fun uh, and interesting non-game things are, are showing up all over the place. That's awesome. And how big is the library at this point, having just launched, you know, you said September of last year. I think we have about 40... Uh, 35, 40, like individual games on our website. So there's, um, action games, shooter games, puzzle games, um, creativity tools, like art tools, like Figmen. There's for the board gamers out there, there's a couple map builders. So you can do D and D so you can build your own maps. So you can procedurally generate uh, D and D maps and put monsters and buildings and trees and stuff in. And then on the board game side, there's um, a couple platforms for uh, doing board games, which I think accumulates about 140 like board games you can play. Some of the kind of tried and true ones like, you know, poker and stuff like that. And then some licensed games. And, uh, and then we just launched Takanoko. This is our first game that we published ourselves. So we worked with one of our trusted third party developers. Uh, we went out and licensed Takanoko, which is a very popular uh, Japanese game. So we, there's a lot of traction in Japan with us right now. And so that was a good place for us to develop this. And um, it's been really nice. And we learned a lot about what, what to do and what not to do. And uh, it keeps getting better. But it's really fun. You can do four players locally. So our system plugs into PCs and Android phones. So if, for instance, Takanoko, you just boop, 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 plug in four glasses into kind of a mid-grade uh, laptop. And thanks to a bunch of processing we do on the headset, you can have a pretty modest PC and you can play four players around the table and it's just seamless. You just jump in instantly 30 seconds. You can be in there and playing a game of Takanoko and then you can save it and come back to it later. Or if your friends can't join you, you can just remotely log in. Next up we have Catan uh, that's in production right now. So we're doing some super early alpha testing and it looks like it's coming along really nicely. Um, after that, we have a couple uh, non-board games, some more like action video games. I can't tell you what they are yet, but um, we're keeping that model going where we work with third-party developers to bring a bunch of content. And then we go out and we find things that we think we can sprinkle our magic sauce on. And then we um, publish those. And then we also have the labs page, which is pretty cool. Uh, the labs page is where uh, our community, if they just do something, it may not be a full-fledged anything, but it's just kind of interesting. We can put it up there and people can download it. So there's some fairly um, complete games. Uh, there's some interesting like art demos. There's uh, desktop. So you can mirror your desktop over on the Tilt 5 system. So um, that that's growing in leaps and bounds too. Our SDK is amazingly easy to use. And that's my co-founder's uh, magic that he's brought to the the table. He, he comes from NVIDIA. He worked at uh, Google for re running their graphics team for about 15 years. And then he, he came and uh, his obsession is like, if there's something difficult for developers, make it easy. And so mm -hmm. he's taken the SDK. So it's mostly drag and drop. If you have an existing game, you can have it rendering. It takes longer to load the project than to drag and drop our SDK. And you drag and drop, drop it in, you see a a game board gizmo show up in your game and then you can hit play you can do real-time editing with the glasses inside the unity editor so you can see what it looks like and then uh, there's a bunch of little helpers in there like if you want a laser pointer to pick something up you know you just grab that and drop it onto the wand or if you want um the game board like if you have a character that's running through a, a big map you can just like attach the game board to the character and now when the character runs it drags through the big maps so you can have these big mm -hmm. scrolling maps if you're doing multiplayer, you don't have to do any networking for local multiplayer. We have all these helpers. It's just like 
I want four characters that could be anywhere in this giant map. So you put, you just drag game boards, individual game boards onto each of the characters. And so as you sit around the table, like you could be anywhere in the, the universe and you can meet back up and a bunch of features for fog of war for like, you know, where you want to have private information between each user. So we have this layer system, which is really That's easy to use. Cool. Yeah. He's done a really good job. It's like, you know, here's a simple example of like layers, like poker. You know, I don't want you to see what's the, on the face of my cards until they're, they're laid down. So you can assign mm-hmm. layers um, to which game board can see which layer. And then you can switch that dynamically. And Or how uh, a game, uh, oh. kind of off, off a beaten path, you know, not traditional board games, but even something like Civilization. I'm a huge oh. Civilization fan. And to be able to play that until five, you don't have to give any confirmation or <laughs> denial if that's in works or nothing. But like, hell, that's something I advocate in VR. And I think for mm-hmm. a platform like Tilt 5, it's even better. You know, I think that the fog of war effect and, you know, you both are playing on the same board next to each other, but your glasses are seeing different things. And come on, that's that's, that's freaking awesome. That's it's huge. it's and, awesome. I, I love playing video games more than board games um, on our system. So I spend most of my time, like if there's a dog fooding session, like, Hey, we got a new video game, you know, come in and dog food that I'm like, I'm on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and is all the multiplayer local multiplayer? Do do your game support, you know, yeah, networked we, online? We have a bunch of remote, like a lot of the, that board game platform tabletopia, it's remote. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you have two, two computers, then of course you can do network between those two computers and do local that way too. Um, and then, um, we're getting a ton of software that's on the way that's just local only or hybrid where it's in unity and unreal. We support both. Actually Godot is coming too. Um, networking is really a pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so hard to do networking, right? And it, it, you can consume more time doing networking. So that's why we felt, you know, one of our biggest impacts is when you're sitting across from each other, looking each other in the eye, having that big battle or that collaboration. We wanted to make it like zero effort for developers to unlock that. We also made it so in the latest drivers, uh, if it's a single player game, you can plug in extra glasses and just spectate. So that makes it really nice. You can pass controls around. You can do hot seat without, you know, or turn based. You know, I play the first level and like, ah, I can't do it. You try and uh, that's really powerful as well. Uh, there's so much in there. That's freaking cool. We have Mixcast integration too, which is really sweet. So uh, Mixcast is a tool where you can just put a webcam, multiple webcams even if you want, point it at the game board. It finds the game board, and then it composites what the game looks like. You can stream it out to Twitch and YouTube and TikTok, all your favorite social media. And uh you know, it's, that's one of the hardest things in VR and AR, right? It's like expressing what um, the experience looks like. And so this tool really shows a very accurate representation of like how things are popping out of the board. And there's always confusion about what our system is going to look like. You know, people look at it and they like, like, oh yeah, but you can't have 3D past the end of the retroflector. And it's like, what they don't realize is like, you have such a big game surface. Like it's this giant volume of space where you can have these giant things poking out right at you. It's like a television. You don't even think about the edge of the board. And, and with this mixed cast tool, you can kind of really represent what the player is seeing. We started doing uh, live streams. Um, we're going to do a lot more. Uh, We surveyed all of our customers um, that have gotten systems and, you know, it's a bitter pill to swallow sometimes when people are like upset and it's like, it was very apparent what we were doing wrong in some areas. Like people that got their kits in September, you know, they're writing back with, there's no multiplayer games. I got a three pack and I'm so mad. And it's like, oh, or I wanted this type of game and you don't have it. And like, wait, we've got like four of those now. I'm like, what? We haven't been good. We've been good at communicating to new customers. We're learning to get better at communicating to our current customers (laughs) (laughs) what's available. So that's our task in the next year is to get really good at like letting people know what the heck they can do with the system. Like I've been addicted to Headland, which is this um, really cool. um, It feels a lot like Zelda. Um, It's pretty neat. Um, uh, I have been getting more into board games. It's not as much my thing, but uh, 
have to say I'm a current leader around the office for Takanoko. <laughs> <laughs> like not usually my cup of tea, but this one I got down. <laughs> hey, if you guys ever want to do a, a stream and uh, play some remote stuff, we could arrange something. It may oh, be yeah, a, that... it might be a bit of a shit show uh, since we're <laughs> <laughs> as a company we're learning how to uh, stream, but. Hey, it's okay. We always joke as podcasters, we're learning on the go as well. So it'll be, it'll be mutual. <laughs> <sighs> oh, guys, I'm sorry. I, I, man, I've been talking forever. You no, no, I, no. It, uh, pound for pound, this is going to become one of my most favorite interviews ever. We joke about our Hall of Fame of interviews. This yeah. is on it. And if anything, yeah. you know, there's definitely a hundred more things I want to ask, but I know that you leaves... have a whole notepad of questions, but they're irrelevant because the story that just unfolded is yeah. pretty friggin' intense. If anything, you know, that just leaves great room for a part two yes. interview. So you know, this was the part two. Oh my this, God, this was the there could be a, this could be the first twenty five percent. Yeah, to be honest. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I'd love to have you back on and a couple months talk about the progress of the library growth the user feedback yeah, i'm and- expecting we're going to hear more and more you know i hopefully seeing a good marketing campaign where and for some reason my brain thought the product was out longer than just mm-hmm. september of last year when you had said that i was like no freaking way for some reason i thought it was it's funny how time goes it both goes fast and also things can get, seem like it's been out longer than it has you know well, we've been at it for five, probably five and a half years now. I don't, time flies. I mean, yeah. I mean, we did our Kickstarter. We were a year and probably a month or two over on Kickstarter. I mean, we had to deal with COVID and everything. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole story in itself how we made robotic fixtures to build the glasses in China with never stepping foot on soil in China and that, and how. You can't, you can't double check the circuit to make sure they didn't cost cut. <laughs> Oh, I mean, that's why it took us until September to get them out. It's like, you know, you know, technically we probably had, we did have some units out before September, but, you know, we would build like 300 units and we'd get them in and we'd do a full inspection. It's like, oh, 299 of them have to be reworked and, oh, oh because, you know. The factory just didn't know how to. Don't put your fingers on the lenses inside on the optics engine. It's like, oh. <laughs> you're like, oh. I guess it's like programming. You got to be very specific with the instructions, you know. <laughs> yeah, and the English second language makes it a little tricky, and not being able to go there, and and then the factory shut down. Like every two or three months, the factory would mm. shut down because of COVID and stuff. So it was really tricky, but but we did it, and so you know. Thank goodness I'm not going to be on a kick scammer video. So <laughs> no, but uh, like I said, we'd we'd love to have you back on. Oh, we have again. to, man. yeah. And I, and there's so much more I want to. Let's I do a remote more. game sometime. We can uh, talk and play till five or something. Yeah, that'll be that'll be perfect. So oh, we'll, I'm down. We'll set that up, and then uh, for our listeners, if you know they heard the story and now they they're dying for a tilt five, where can you know is it simple as tilt five dot com? You mentioned it, maybe some back order. You know, how much does it cost for somebody wanting to get it? And where can they find you all on social media just to follow along, too? Yeah, we'd really appreciate it if folks uh, would take a chance on us and get out there and start playing and, you know, be engaged and try the content. Let us know. And, you know, we're receptive to hearing where we're screwing up and everything. And, <laughs> and so the way to, uh, to get a system, uh, you just go to tilt5.com, all spelled out. And there'll be a buy now button somewhere on there. And um, there, um, the base kit is $359. That gets you a nice carrying case uh, that can hold up to three glasses. And you get one pair of glasses, one wand, and one of our deluxe game boards, which is the big game board, which has a bunch of features. Like you can tip it up and do all kinds of fun stuff with it. And uh, the group packs, the way you can think of it is if you wanted two players, just another $300 to get another wand and glasses and cables and everything and, and, and so on. And you just keep adding glasses to it. I highly recommend getting a two player kit. Uh, we are uh, back ordered for like a day or two. I just saw that <laughs> we're like, um, but we're, we're having them shipped, you know, via sea freight so we can keep the costs low for everyone. Um, we also, uh, uh, it's over 30 countries, so it's not North America only. So if you're overseas, 
um, it can be quite costly. You know, you all have to pay your VAT and everything. So it's going to cost you a little bit more and shipping is going to be a little bit more because they get dispatched from Taiwan or uh, I forget the other distribution point, but um, that'll get better in time. What else? Um, we're starting to add more accessories. There's going to be some fun stuff coming that make the system a little bit more flexible that you can add on to it. Um, in fact, we can, you know, one of the things people have been asking for is dual wielding wands. It comes with one <laughs> wand. Uh, That'd be me. Yeah. There's a, we just got a music rhythm game that um, I, I'm anxious for us to put extra wands on the, on the, uh, the store. Uh, it's called song beater and it has this, it's kind of, it's, it's more Zen like. And so with one wand, it's pretty good, but I think it would be even more Zen with two. So like the notes kind of bob towards you across the table at the rhythm you're supposed to hit them. And it's just, I don't know. It's not like the adrenaline rush of Beat Saber. It's just, it just has this feel to it. And with one wand, you're kind of swiping through two, two notes and three notes at a time. But I, I really want to get, get it updated to do two. Cause I am maybe like Carmack. I am one of those lazy gamers. I do kind of want to <laughs> sit back and playing Beat Saber for five minutes is fun, but then I want to sit down for 45 minutes. <laughs> it's been great too. Our third party developers that have telemetry have been um, feeding back like play session times. Play session times have been extremely long. Like people play Takenoko for an hour and a half, Figment XR. They say that there's multi hour sessions on that. And that's really a testament to how light, comfortable, and easy it is to use our system. Yeah. Do you mind holding it up one more time? Yeah. I mean, this is an old prototype, but it's all right. So this is the glasses here. So they have folding arms. They have built-in speakers right here that point towards your ears. There's a microphone up in here that picks up your, your voice has interchangeable nose pieces that you can put in to accommodate different face shapes. Uh, a lot of our users have been getting those foam pads that you can get from, uh, as a drugstore for regular glasses to kind of tweak it. Um, yeah, and it works over the top of glasses, you know, because it, because you can, yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> for you, you may want to put a couple of those foam pads to, to lift right. it up a tiny bit. Uh, it has two cameras built into it. This is kind of cool. One of the cameras tracks the user's position plus the, um, the, the magic wand and it's an extremely wide field of view. So you can have the wand like way above you and way down in your lap. And it's, we're really proud of like, you know, how we um, got that going. Then we have, and this has just got unlocked in our SDK. It's our tangible tracking camera. And so that allows you to read numbers of dice and playing cards and track where figures are on the table. So in a handful of months, we'll start to see applications coming out, taking advantage of that. And there's, hand tracking in the works too. Uh, then the wand, uh, everyone laughs because it looks like a barbecue lighter and that's um, <laughs> our, our industrial designers hated this, this design. And this is just an echo of my time at valve. I'm like, it worked really well. Like we should start there. And, uh, we tried, you know, the, the rings, like we had a ring system well before Oculus came out with their ring and all kinds of stuff, but it, all, all of them had different problems. Like the ring would get in the way of all the AR experience in front of you. You don't want that. And then uh, we had like a thing that looked like a stingray that came down the sides. But when you held the game controller sideways, like a Nintendo game pad that got in the way of your thumb. Mm. And so as much as the industrial designers hated it, they, uh, they went with the, uh, the barbecue lighter. And this has actually been great. Um, I just saw a tweet the other day. It was really heartwarming. So there's a developer in Japan that's been doing a bunch of nerf stuff with our system and which is really cool, but he took it over to his father's and they played Figment XR for a couple hours where they were just kind of playing and drawing and doing stuff. And he's like, my father has never taken interest in any of my XR stuff. This is the first time I've been able to get him to sit down and like, you know, try it out and play with me. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> Uh, what no. did I miss? There's a bunch of, oh, well, on the technical side, your audience may find this interesting since you're VR, um, you know, kind of uh, specialists and aficionados. Uh, inside, we have a processor that does what we call reprojection. So, you know, it's kind of like time warp for 
you know, VR systems and things like that. But ours is uh, really cool because it does a lot of um, frame rate upscaling. And so your game can run at any frame rate, you know, probably anything above 30 frames per second. And you can't even tell the difference because it interpolates up to 180 frames a second between all the frames, plus adjusts the position, you know, on the table. So it's rock solid. And so that was one of our big innovations. And that allows us to do some really cool stuff. So that's how we can do multiple systems over um, one PC. We've had one crazy user that was using the uh, shadow um, virtual PCs out in the Mm -hmm. cloud (laughs) running our system. I heard of one person that got some kind of uh, wireless uh, USB dongle and running it. And uh, just because we can absorb any random latency and it's all asynchronous, we don't have to be V-sync locked like VR um, opens up possibilities around doing that kind of stuff. An engineering wizard yeah, is what's going on. Yeah. And and just to, for my own curiosity, you, you, you're you all self-taught, right? Yeah, I there mean, was no high school. There was no. Finished high school or college in that, you Yeah, know? I was trying to like, like, no, I didn't really see any in there. Nope. I love that. I've had really okay. great, it's all mentors. And, you know, what's really amazing is being here in Silicon Valley, I've had mentors like Wozniak, like giving me advice, like, being a kid growing up in a town of like 3000 people, you know, just to think that I could even meet someone like Wozniak, let alone like have Wozniak, you know, give me some, you know, wisdom and advice on like how to like do a startup. It's pretty amazing. Nolan Bushnell or Al Alcorn, just tons and tons of these people that, and I think it's just, there's a lot of great people around in the tech industry, but also just like if you, are ready to absorb that information that they're going to give you. They're just, people are just so willing to give it to you. I mean, I, I do a lot of mentoring myself uh, these days. And one of the pieces of advice that I, I give folks is like, take anything I say with a large grain of salt. You know, I don't have the same situational awareness about your situation that you do, but if you start talking to like four or five people and you start hearing the same thing over and over again, it might be something you should consider (laughs) And so that's how I approach now that I, you know, have so many really great folks around me. It's like, I'm kind of hearing the same thing over and over again. I should probably like snap to and, and, and listen. (laughs) (laughs) And I have a lot of mentors that are much younger than I am. I'm getting kind of old these days and it's some mentors (laughs) come in all ages. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I think even in your, your earlier years when you were, offering employees the possibility to purchase the business from you. You were already giving it back way back then because most people wouldn't take that route. They would just, you know, business isn't going to make it. We're going to shut the doors and my apologies, but you know, not even that option to make an employee owned situation. People thought that I was crazy for doing that. And, you know, even in the startup world, I've worked at so dozens of startups and I've seen the good and bad and, you know, that 100K or 200K of inventory, yeah, it probably could have been very helpful, but I'm very glad I did it. And I'm glad I had like this extreme level of transparency of what was going on. It's compassionate for your personnel working with you. Like some of these people, you know, have serious stuff in their life. They have to monitor and and make sure that you know, their life is secure. So you need to be compassionate. Let them know like shit's hitting the fan. Like would love to see you stick around, but if you don't, I fully understand it. And nine times out of 10 people will be like, believe in the mission. I'm going to stick around. Let's just, let's put our heads together and figure this out. And that's the direction I've taken startups. I've been in where they try to hide things from personnel. Hey, these are engineers in most cases. They're really smart people. (laughs) They can do the simple math. And usually what happens when you're in those situations where, you know, things are going sideways and, you know, they're going to, they're going to invent things in their mind that are way worse than it really is. Like if you're trying to hide things from them, well, it's like our customer surveys, we got thousands and thousands of responses back and you know, there were a lot of them in there that were just like, love it. Oh, this is really cool. And it's like, you see those, and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. But then you get like, 
you know, 30% of them have like serious usability problems with your system. And it's like, you could be tempted to just like only show the team, like the good news. And it's like, we didn't do that. It's like, yeah, a lot of people liked our stuff, but here is bam. And it was almost like dropping a grenade in the middle of the room. Everyone's like, but then everyone rallied. It's like, okay. And it's been really wonderful in the last month or two since we've done that. It's like, holy crap, they're like fixing these serious usability issues and like (laughs) rallying behind like, oh, we're idiots for not telling our customers we have really cool games that just came online this week. Let's get on that and start. (laughs) It's, It's all a learning process. And that's a great thing about startups too is, you know, I think that's why I was scared to be CEO of my previous company. I thought that you had to like plot entirely into the future, exactly how you were going to be successful. And that's not how any startup ever goes. And I was an idiot for not remembering all these startups that I was at. Like we never ended up exactly where we thought we were going to be even a year out. And so I, I look at it this way. I tell our team like, you know, my job is to give us kind of a frustum like this. We're going to go roughly in this direction your job is to kind of like refine that and figure out what's that not stupid path uh, within this kind of direction and get everyone, everyone's hand on the steering wheel to make sure we don't go off the cliff. No, I got, I got faith till five is going to be around for oh, yeah. some time, like especially said, with the, what I don't, we've heard, but I don't yeah, think this will be the, we'll do a two point, a two point oh episode. So yeah. Another episode, a live stream, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll have some fun for sure. <laughs> It's an interesting time in XR right now. It's like Zuckerberg's face planted the metaverse. Um, the, uh, you know, attach rates are kind of low on VR right now. It's, it's VR is one of these industries that just, it's like a roller coaster. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see what Apple releases. I just want all the big players to have their cards on the table. I'm so stunned. Yeah. I'm, I'm, at, so I'm, stoked. A, I'm, I'm a believer of, you know, the more the merrier, you know, the more in the market the better for the most part, you know, it's, I'm not, you know, the uh, Apple headset, sometimes it's a little bit of a mythological beast of if it's ever actually going to come out, but mm. I've been hearing it since I hope it, t- 2019, like this is the year. And I, yeah, there's yeah. like a pretty prominent uh, voice out there in the XR space. That's like it's Who, Robert this- Scoble. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> we have a little friendly bet going, which he's lost about six years in a row. <laughs> yeah, well, the the thing is, the year he's right, he's right. So that's the problem. <laughs> if he says it every year, and then one year he's right, well, he'll he'll suddenly forget about the five. But he's always a fun follow. I like enjoying his tweets because it's it's the year of Apple every year for sure. Yeah, but, I, I you know, can't I can't wait because it's I hope they make, do good. Yeah, yeah. it's going to make our system oh. look like you know pretty amazing because you're not going to have <laughs> you're not going to have four three thousand dollar devices. Uh, <laughs> in your home not my home at least yeah that's the that's the tough part but uh <laughs> you know you know hey thank thank you again jerry for taking this time i again we we said it a hundred times i'll say it again we'd love to have you back it's on our hall oh, of fame yes. of oh yeah it's of already interviews. it's already one of my top three we'll talk Aww. about uh <laughs> a live stream you know maybe there we can ask a little bit more of the the random questions that pop in the brain but you know we <laughs> we, we had a blast for sure and for our yeah. listeners you know Definitely go follow Jerry on social media. Go follow Tilt Five, and if you've been on the fence, you come just, on. You just got. You just heard the lowdown. Yeah, you know it's going nowhere but up. So yeah, so. give it. Give us a little support. We're the small guys out there. Like, <laughs> we're not putting fifteen billion dollars a year into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I back calculated out every thirty minutes we could run our entire company off of what Facebook's dumping in. It's like, geez, geez every thirty minutes. So yeah, we, we need a little, a little boost and help to, to break mm-hmm. through the noise. That's no, what we I joke think, sometimes as podcasters. Yeah, really, you know. Take one Facebook minute. <laughs> Just one. I'm set for a couple of years. We're good. That's too fun. That's too funny. Awesome. No, well, thanks for having me. No, no it thank was, you. It was a blast. Like I said, Hall of Fame episode for sure. And again, for our listeners, definitely go check out Jerry, go check out Tilt 5. And again, I don't think this is the, the last you'll hear, hear of that. Mm-hmm.